Hello and welcome back to the Red Special Guitar Podcast. I'm your host, John Underhill, and today we're going to be talking to Mark Reynolds, who we all know as Trisonics from the Forum, who has been around a very long time, has a wealth of knowledge and experience with the Red Special. But before we listen to Mark's wonderful episode, which is about two hours long, let's take a look at our brand new intro by Martin Pitcher. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this week on the podcast, we have been blessed to have possibly the father of the Red Special community online, it certainly was when I, I, I joined. Um, he's named after a pickup, and we can ask him why. This week, we have Trisonics Mark Reynolds with us. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you very much, John. How are you? Yeah, pretty good, Mark. Thank you, all, all things considered. Have you um, been keeping safe and well this last 18 months? Yeah, yeah, we've all been good. We're, uh, we've we've got through it okay so far, so that's good news. And yeah, I, I assume you have as well. <laughs> yeah, not too bad, thanks. It's um it's certainly been testing for for many reasons, but forced me to do the podcast, so maybe it's not such a bad thing no, after all. Good. Although I can't think many people will think that that's anyway. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, you have been around. You were around when I first joined the Brian May World Forums. Your name has been there on documents and, and things in the red special community for well before i was around how did you get into it what, what how did you get into queen what was your first memory of, of hearing queen and going i need to to do that i need to get that guitar um my first well my first listening to of queen would have been um seven seas of rye i heard that on the radio and i thought wow that's a good song and I liked all these harmony things that were going on in the background. And uh, so I, I, I didn't know Queen before that. Um, so that would be around about 74. I was 11. And I just started playing the guitar at that point. Um, and um, so I spoke to my cousin, who was big into music, and uh, he got me the Queen 2 album. And uh, so that's really where it started. And for, for initially, the guitar sound was a bit strange to me. I sort of thought it sounded like this really big guitar coming out of a very small amplifier in a way. Not, I don't mean the D key in the sense of the little harmony things, but the, yeah. it was a very compressed tone and it was a bit strange, really. But I really liked it. I just thought it was so good. And I loved the way that the band themselves could go from a really quiet thing. Like White Queen is my absolute favourite Queen song. And I just love the way that it goes from quiet to power and then back to quiet again. They were just masters of that. And that's, that's what gripped me. That's what got me into them. So, so that was so Queen 2. Did, did you listen to that? I'm guessing you, you got the LP of that and then used to put that on and then jog it back to the beginning again and listen again and I did yeah again, I did. again and again yeah I did I had a, this simple dance set radio uh, sorry radio gram uh, record player yeah. and uh, and I was playing this record and in fact it, it was mono <laughs> so it must have been a bit strange for a start but anyway yeah it progressed to something stereo so yeah and then so you're obviously listening to Queen 2 and and all of the different songs on that album inspired by um, <laughs> Seven Seas of Rye. Oh, That's correct, completely... yeah, Seven Seas of Rye. Yeah, they're track. So, um, so you've obviously then discovered the rest of the album, and obviously I'm sure everyone listening will have listened to Queen too. This, the album follows a path through through the songs, doesn't it? It's... It does, yeah. It was it's, interesting it's not... because the, the Seven Seas of Rye track was kind of not... not poppy or even though it was in the charts it wasn't quite as poppy as some of the stuff that was around at that time you know like the glam rock it, it sort of fit the glam rock era but it was a bit more serious and and I liked the the way the album went I mean Freddie's voice was quite strange as well because he's very very clean vocal for a rock singer and uh, it was just just a really interesting album and I just got to love all the other stuff on it there's nothing on that album that I don't like I think it's just a brilliant album it certainly is for sure. It's spawned a lot of us, and uh, 
many, many hours of time listening to try and capture various elements and bits and pieces. So yeah. where did you go from there then? Did, so you're obviously listening to that and you picked up guitar. Have you put two and two together or are you still sort of learning guitar and listening along? I've been playing, when I got the album, I, probably, I think I've been playing guitar for about six or seven months just at school, you know, just playing chords and things like that. And my major influence really was George Harrison of the Beatles and Donovan, the folk singer. So, because I was very into folk music as a kid, I liked the folk music. So, I, initially, I mean, I didn't have an electric guitar until uh, se- late 75, 76, which I bought off a schoolmate, which was actually a Gibson, a uh, Gibson SG. And uh, I paid £20 for it. He didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. And um, and then, <laughs> so I was I was quite blessed with a good quality guitar, even though I didn't know it at the time, and cheap amp. And that's um, it was then that I, that I, that around that time that I wanted to get into the rock music more. I, I tried to play a few along to some of the Queen songs on acoustic, but I wasn't really that advanced as a player really at that time, so it was a little bit difficult. So I was more of a listener, but I was really getting into rock music. So that's when the electric came in around late seventy five, seventy six. Mm. Sort of obviously, you've just said that you weren't trying to copy or look to play Queen songs at that point. Obviously, no. you're still listening to them. Are they were they as big an influence at that point as they obviously became later on, or was it still one of many things you were listening to that then Queen grew later? It, yeah, I'd say that that's correct. I, I I think I was just influenced by all the different music that I liked, and I was trying to pick things out. The Beatles things were easier to play, of course. But but as I yeah but as I moved on with the electric and got a little bit more into it and started learning how to do riffs and things like that, that's when Queen began to get, it grip me into the, that kind of playing more. And I think it was probably the time when when I heard we were rocky. Uh, I think seventy seven was when I really started to get into playing. You know that that was the kind of thing that I was interested in then. Just because it's interesting. So in '77, you've heard "We Will Rock You" and you're starting to get into playing Queen music. Obviously, yeah. today you would go YouTube how to play "We Will Rock You," and yeah. there's about a hundred videos showing you how to play "We Will Rock You," and some of them are very good, and some of them aren't particularly wonderful. But in '77, there is no internet. Um, no. Music's hard to come by. Are you? picking that up by ear or are you trying to look at Brian play live on the odd show on the BBC that he was on that you <laughs> managed to see or, or how, how are you trying yeah. to do that back then? Um, I remember just I've always been uh, an ear player I, I listened to songs and I, how I learned to play acoustic was really I, I learned basic chords like most people do at school or from a book I did it at school and then I started listening to Donovan, who was a flat picker and a finger picker, I didn't know that he was um, a finger picker because every time I saw him on the TV, he had a pick in his hand and he was playing. So I was trying to emulate that Travis picking that folk singers play, but with a pick. And that's why I can play quite complicated flat picking stuff because that's how I heard it. I didn't yeah. know that he was doing it by hand. So um, that's how I, I applied it to the Queen thing because by that time I had, I, I think I had a pretty good ear for music. I could hear the different notes and all that. And I used to follow the bass lines around to work out what the basic chords were. So, I mean, in those days, it was, it, it was pretty basic playing in terms of the rock stuff. But I, was, I never really grasped lead playing. So I was more of a rhythm player anyway through the flat picking and the, you know, the acoustic stuff. So at the things like We Will Rock You, well, weren't too difficult to work out because they were more rhythmic and it's like a rhythmic lead break in it as well, isn't it? That did, 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 you know, so it's all kind of rhythmic. So it was a little bit, I wouldn't say it was easy, but it was easier than some of the other stuff, which was really complicated and well over my head at the time, you know, still is in yeah. some time. You know. <laughs> I think every, every time I listen to, a Queen song and I think oh I can play that and then you listen to it and you play it and you record it and you listen back and go I'm so far away <laughs> yeah absolutely tell me about it <laughs> um, <laughs> so 77 you've listened to We Will Rock You you 
obviously decided you're playing electric guitar at that point you, you your then interest is peaked even more in queen do you then go queen crazy from that point on until this day or, or does it still take a bit of time before you start obsessing about brian's guitar and learning the story? Think, well i left school in 1979 started went straight into work then and by that time i was really into queen really into queen so I was playing a lot. Of, I, I'd sort of, I hadn't ditched the acoustic, hadn't stopped playing the acoustic, but I didn't play it as much as I did the electric because I found electric guitars easier to play. As you probably understand yourself, that any, any yeah. guitarist knows that acoustics can be quite hard to play, really. And um, electrics, they've got lower action and all that sort of thing makes it dead easy to play. You don't have to really yeah. squeeze the neck and all that sort of stuff. So the electric was a bit easier to play. And I... I made a massive mistake because I went to, I had this thing about, I wanted a Strat and uh, I took this guitar, the SG, that I didn't know a great deal about to the local music store and I traded it for a Strat, which at the time, I think a Strat was under 200 pound. It was like ridiculously low in price by today's prices. Yeah. And this guy in the shop took one look at it and it was a nicotine, it was white, but it looked like nicotine white, this, this SG, it was quite well used. And uh, this guy said, yeah, I'll do you swap. And that was it. And I lost it. And uh, I got the strat home. I put it on. I thought, oh my God, it's so heavy. The body just felt so heavy because an SG is a really thin body. It's yeah. really thin. And I thought, oh, I don't, I don't like this. And I took it back and the guy says, sorry, I've sold it. <laughs> so that was it. That was the end of the SG. So uh, I got stuck with a strap. And I was playing bright and rock and things like, or trying to play bright and rock and stuff like that on a strap. And it kind of worked because Brian's guitar has got that twang to it anyway, a bit of yeah. a stratty twang. But I couldn't quite get that powerful, you know, the bridge and middle in phase kind of tone, yeah. which was always a bug there. But I, I persevered with a strap for quite a long time on Brian May stuff. Yeah. Were you then, because you're saying you're playing Brighton Rock, so that's the, I'm guessing the main rhythm, rhythm part to the actual album song, not not the, no, the Brighton Rock I, solo. I, or I you... a, no, I, I didn't didn't bother with the album version. Um, I had, because obviously back in those days, we had audio tapes and people used to get these uh, live concerts and you could buy them from these market stores. Um, in town and they were just bootlegs basically and I used to play along to the Hammersmith Odeon concert which was the three blind mice bit and all that sort yeah. of thing and uh, so really I was messing around it was all ad lib Brian was ad libbing wasn't he so it didn't really matter if it if it didn't quite sound the same as Brian played the same as Brian but the only thing I couldn't do was the delays yeah. because I had nothing I didn't have a delay pedal or anything no. Did, did you know how he was doing it back then? Or were you guessing? Or were you thinking it's a studio effect? Or is it just completely mine? Like, I don't know how he... Or did you have a crazy theory? Or um, Well, no, I had seen that programme. The one that's recently appeared on the internet, the one with Mike Reed, the DJ, who um, where Brian is using his old pedal board rig with the, yeah. with the uh, Echo Plexes. Um, yeah. I had seen that on TV and I actually mentioned it to Brian when I met him and, um, I, and I said I'd seen him on, I said Magpie, but it wasn't Magpie. It was, uh, I forget what the name of the program was now, but it wasn't Magpie. It was something else. That was a kid's program back in the seventies where they did used to have pop stars on there occasionally. And um, so I, I knew he was using Echoplex, but I didn't know he had the extended rails or anything like that. And I used to go to this music shop called Soundpad in Leicester and um it's um it was it was the place everybody went and they had an echoplex and they also had a wem copycat and i used to go in every saturday and play this echoplex which i couldn't afford and i was doing this sort of trying to play these brian may riffs and the delay was like it was like i was going delete 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 so it was so quick he couldn't really get it anywhere near the speed the slow speed that brian was getting yeah. so it was dead frustrating and I, I, I knew nothing. I didn't know anything about his rig at all. I didn't know about travel boosters or yeah. anything like that. So I had no idea. I mean, I, I, I knew he had an AC30. I knew he used Trisonics and I knew he had this handmade guitar. But other than that, I really didn't know much about his rig at all. Interesting. So when did you learn 
about the handmade guitar was that something that you read in an article in the guitar magazine or with, how, did, how did you find that um, well um i had uh, i didn't at the time i didn't have that magazine i have got it now the one from 1973 uh, the music uh, i forget what it's called now a guitar i think it was called and uh, it's an old magazine from 73 and brian it was the first interview brian did and he discussed his guitar in quite a lot of depth, I think, in that interview, which is uh, which I think a lot of people have read that now or seen it on the yeah. Internet. And I had actually read that and I was quite intrigued. But that wasn't until sort of like late 70s, probably 79 or 80. A friend of mine had a copy of it and he let me borrow it and I read it. And again, it didn't really mean a great deal to me, although it sort of explained to me why Brian's guitar was quite sonic you know, in the way that he'd built it. It was going on about the resonance and stuff like that. I was thinking, what the hell is all that about, you know? And, um, but Brian's guitar to me always had this unusual feel to it and power that it just sang. It was just a sweet tone that other guitarists didn't seem to have. So, yeah, so that was the first time really that I heard a little bit about the, the guitar. And then after that, I, obviously, I had a little bit of money because I had a job. And I started buying the magazines and any interviews and stuff. I've, got, I've still got quite a lot of them, so I'll have to dig them out, scan them for people. But and the, he talks a lot about his rig in the early days and also the, you know, his guitar. Yeah. So it wasn't until probably '85 that we really knew about the guitar. And was that sort of like? Um, I mean, I remember for me it was like he made his own guitar with his dad, and he's still using it. Like it was like a real like, I don't know. I think not eureka moment but like i i can't describe he made his own guitar and he's still using it that's amazing was it was it like well, that for you or was it yeah it was because i was sort of thinking it must be a really well-made guitar because it obviously I, I knew he'd made it back in the 60s and i was thinking he's used it all that time as a teenager and you know probably yourself when you're a teenager you have no respect for anything really when it comes to quit <laughs> you just sort of chuck the guitar in the car leaning up against the radiator and sort of things like that you don't really think about that side of it and um so i was thinking it, it must have had some hammer already you know yeah. in all that time the, the battering it had and playing it and you know rallying around with this gear um so, yeah, I was quite surprised, really, that he didn't use anything else. And obviously, we've seen the Strat and the Les Paul and various other instruments that he had as backups. And, of course, to, to me and a lot of like people like Julian and I, Julian's a little bit older than me, not much, but we, we grew up in, around that era. And we only knew the Birch guitar as the only other replica, if you like, of Brian's guitar. So... That was kind of an interesting instrument to us. That was a unique instrument to us as well. So it was quite weird to see him always using his own guitar. And but it, but it was funny. I always remember when they brought out um, Crazy Little Thing Called Love, and he was playing a Telecaster. And I was thinking, what are you doing? Why aren't you playing your guitar? It's better than that. Well, you know. And I didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. Why he used the Telecaster? Looking back, I understand now. But you know, at the time, I was that spitting blood. You know. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I can relate yeah. to that. It, it, even though it was a lot later, I remember watching the video after having learned about the, the Red Special and you're just like, you've dedicated your life to this guitar. Why are you using something else, you crazy man? Absolutely, like, you know, why would you? It's like blaspheming in the video. <laughs> He's obviously been strong-armed into yeah. it, otherwise he, he, he wouldn't have done it. But so, you, <laughs> so you've obviously gone, you're, you're now working, you've got... Um, your strat and you're you're going to the you've got some more information um you then have been obviously you now know about the guitar being homemade and you're, you're trying to find your way through the, the very difficult path back then of understanding brian's rig and information absolutely um and what happened next did you find someone else who'd made one or were you did you like how long was it from there till the start of meeting people that were building them because I, I think one of the first people you met had made because obviously at some points people I'm mixing my words quite a bit but someone started to make replicas of the guitar at some point because people would do because that's a natural thing to do yeah was it that that inspired you to do yours or how does that come about because there's obviously quite a gap from the late 70s to early 80s 
obviously I know you from the internet meeting you online in the early 2000s there's a big big gap there and obviously you built your guitar and done lots of other things which we'll come on to but how, how do we get from that point to to there well briefly through the 80s uh, the first red special replica i ever saw was a um uh the japanese bm is it bm 900 800 yeah, uh, yeah. Um, um greco greco yeah. And and it was in the it, they had one in the local music shop, uh, not not Soundpad, but another music shop in Leicester. And I thought, wow, you know, and, I, and of course I was at work and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to pay for this. And I went down and I, I picked this guitar up, I had, a, I had a play on it. And the guy in the shop was a Brian May fan as well, funnily enough. And we got this amp out, we plugged it in. And it just sounded nothing like Brian. I said, like, well, this is a con. You know, because, again, we didn't know about treble boosters. And I was thinking it should sound good. It just sounded like a bit like a sort of a heavy strap, really. Exactly. You know, it wasn't wired correctly or anything like that. And, again, I didn't really quite understand this series parallel stuff and at that time, even though I was an apprentice electrician. <laughs> I didn't quite understand it on the, uh, on the guitars. So, yeah. to me, a humbucker was a humbucker and a single chord was a single chord and that was it one was fatter than the other it didn't really mean anything to me other than that um so that was the first one and then because it didn't sound anything like brian's guitar i thought oh, i'm not going to buy that and um yeah. and then of course the guild came along the guild 84 which looked a million times better than the uh, greco and again it was just too much money and uh so really, I was looking at Washburns because Washburns back in the 1980s had the double cutaway and they had a sort of a round body with two horns. And I thought, to myself, I wonder if I could just shape that bottom horn a little bit and I could get something that looked like Brian's guitar and it had a Fender style trem on it. I thought, well, it's yeah. got a trem on it. It's going to be three single chord pickups. It's got to sound like Brian. But <laughs> anyway, it never got there. I never did that. Uh, so scooting along really to, it was really in the early 90s that I seriously thought about making a guitar. And I'd met this guy called Adam Marshall. Um, and he was he had a couple of red specials that he'd made himself. He was an apprentice woodworker. And um, he had made a couple of guitars. And I went over to see him. He lived in Northampton. And um, I, I was sort of like, wasn't sure about whether or not um, I could do it. But anyway, he gave me a plan, a, 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 an actual guitar plan for the Red Special, which was a real, you know, amazing. And, yeah. um, and, it and it had Julian's name on it. And he mentioned to me that this Julian Hemingway um, had, um, I think he'd supplied him with it or he got it through someone who he'd already supplied in the past. And um, so I thought, oh, I've got a starting point here. So um, I ended up buying a guitar off this Adam Marshall, which um, I'll have to dig the pictures out for it. It's one he made. It, it looked like the Red Special. Um, it had DiMarzio pickups on it at the time when I got it, uh, the, the DiMarzio Brian May ones. And um, I, I played it and played it and played it. And it was okay. It's a great guitar, but I think it was a solid body. I don't think it had much cavity in it or anything. And it, it never quite got me where I wanted. And so I... Um, then thought about building this guitar. Then I saw an advert in a local guitar magazine, uh, one of the U UK guitar magazines, and it's and the guy selling a Red Special lived in Leicester, and I thought that must be Julian. It's got to be yeah. Julian. And anyway, I looked. I kept ringing this number, and it it never connected. It, the number was printed wrong. So because he lived in Leicester, I just went to the phone book, looked for Julian Hemingway, <laughs> rang him up, and said are you the guy selling the guitar? And he said, yeah. And I said, um, I think they printed your number wrong <laughs> in the magazine. He said, oh, I wonder why nobody ever rang. So <laughs> I went over to see him and arranged to see him. And he made these guitars and they looked absolutely fabulous. He got the trem off too, you know. Then he told me all about meeting Brian and, you know, on that um, Capital Workshop radio. Yeah. And um, fabulous guy, really, really nice guy. I'm still really good friends with him. and We've been friends ever since. And um, so he kind of really got me where I wanted to be, really, for building the guitar. So if it hadn't have been for dropping onto Julian's diagrams, I would never have even got anywhere near it. So yeah. that's where it started. So I'm, I'm guessing then, just trying to connect the dots, with, with meeting Julian and him having been on the, the Capital Radio show where he actually took one of his homemade guitars and 
played on stage with Brian and yeah. was given a, a Pete Cornish treble booster um, for his troubles, I believe. Is, is that where you learn about treble boosters? Because that must have been like well, a, adding a secret box of magic to your guitar if you you had been trying to play and get Brian's tone without one. And then all of a sudden, June's like, well, I've got this treble booster you plug in and it makes it do this. Yeah. I was I was a bit cap in hand when I got to his house and I was going, could I copy the circuit? You know, could I copy yeah. the circuit, please? You know, and he, <laughs> and he said, well, you know, as soon as you're going to make the guitar, you may as well have a pedal. So, yeah, you know, and uh, I, I, and I really kind of bludgeoned him into it. But there, there was a, um, uh, it, I, I built one. And again, at that time, I didn't know a great deal about, you know, the, the transistor, influence in terms of its yeah. value and that type of thing so i built something close to it but it wasn't quite as powerful as junior's and um but i had i got the basics i got it there yeah. started and so anyway after that i just got all the wood together I, once i got my head around it the, the thing i couldn't get my head around was how the tremolo works i'd never seen it written not properly only in that book that magazine way back and i of course, I've forgotten all about well, how that was assembled anyway, and it wasn't overly detailed. So Julian taught me through it, showed me his, and uh, I thought, all right, I get it now. So I made uh, the tremolo system first, and then I started knocking the wood together. And uh, I, I used all the same woods, and, you know, uh, as you know, but um, my guitar has cavities, but not quite in the same way as Brian's, because I didn't know the full extent in those days, neither yeah. did Julian, only, only a diagram that Brian had given him, a sketch. So, yeah, anyway, so that's it, really. I just spent about, um, I think it was eight months building this guitar um, in between jobs at work. I did more guitar building than I did work at, you know, work at work. <laughs> but uh, the company had everything. They had the machines, they had all the milling yeah. machines, the lathes. The woodworking machines everything so i was able to do it easy easy in terms of just getting things cut up and shaped up yeah so and i i spent about eight months and i finished it uh in 1995 late 1995 and and that was it really um but i i hadn't really got the pickups and um because you couldn't find any anywhere and I didn't really want to put the DiMarzios in it, which I did originally, if I remember rightly. I dropped those in for a short while. But then I contacted um, Kent Armstrong and asked him if he had any or if he could make me some or something like that. And he said, well, you're in luck, he said, because Burns have just contacted me and they want me to make Burns Trisonics. And he said, but I'm not allowed to sell them to the public. So, oh, God, you know, here we go again. So I, post, I posted him a letter because we didn't have emails and things then. And I sent him a letter and a photo of the guitar that I built. And I think he took pity and he said, yeah, OK, you can have a set. They're 150 quid or whatever. Yeah. And it was a lot of money, but I bought them. And, and they were, I mean, I know by today's standards, you know, with the Aidsons and stuff like that. Yeah. They, they were a mile off really in a way but they just sounded good and that and they looked the part and that was it so that's yeah. really how i got my guitar all together yeah so julian's um well if, you, if that number hadn't been wrong you, you might not have looked him up and he might have sold the guitar already no. and passed all the information off to somebody else so you, you did it. well then i Mark. don't think he actually sold the guitar in yet <laughs> no i don't think <laughs> he did actually from talking to him yeah no no, no, that's right. Good. But, you know, his, his guitar work was fabulous. It was just stunning. I was just in awe of him, really, because of his knowledge and everything. He, he knew an answer for everything, you know, so he was, he's extremely helpful. I'm eternally grateful to him for that. Yeah. And he's still exactly the same to this day. If, you know, on the forum, he's up there posting answers and questions and technical information and his guitars, he's still building to this day a, a pretty spot on, is, if you yeah. ask me. He's rehashed <laughs> quite a few of the old ones. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i guess over time for him as well as more information has come out in the book and obviously other pictures and the x-rays and more details and other replicas being made yeah. he's managed to pick up some of the information but his guitars are, are stunning as much as is your your own which i have had the pleasure of playing once or twice it, it's okay i mean i, I you know, looking back at it, I, I was really excited about it, as you would anybody would be who just made a guitar that they really wanted. And like Brian, you know, Brian didn't have 
what he wanted and so he just had to make something and he obviously it was a lucky thing and it worked and he loved it to bits and in the same way I love what I'd made but you know if I if I did it again I'd make the neck less like a fence post and more like a guitar neck because as you know my guitar I did you see I had no idea what Brian's neck was like so I knew he it was basically modeled on an acoustic and a lot of acoustic I, I've I'm a 12 string player really and have been for a very long time and I'm used to very fat necks. So I've never had a problem playing big necks and my Washburn 12 string, which I bought in 1979 has the same, virtually the same profile as Brian's. And uh, funnily enough, I've never even used that as a, as a, an example for my own, which was stupid really. I should have done, but I made, uh, I looked at the different uh, shapes of necks going through the years because there was a chart that used to be available and in the 50s and the 40s they were kind of like flat on the side and round at the back like a d shape yeah. and i thought oh, that's got to be something like that so that's what mine is it's very flat on the edge and rounded at the back i can play it so i haven't got a problem so anybody's <laughs> welcome to have a go on it but they won't i'm not sure they'll like it too much i don't know it's but a bit pretty um... that it's I'd say that it's quite an iconic guitar because it's on like when I found all this out and started to fall down the rabbit hole of red specials, it's obviously your story was up there on brianmayworld.com. You'd hit red special and oh. go off to, off to the forum. And there was your um, making my guitar and meeting Brian May. And you had you with all your different pictures yeah. and, um, and then your story of making your guitar and, how you went about certain things and what you did and some of the build shots and the finished pictures and then how you you met Brian May which was um yeah you know when you first stumble on it I used to I dread to think how many times I read that article and then um, <laughs> looked at those photos well Oliver who ran that site Oliver Taminga uh he he, he ran that site uh, I, I think it's still work, I think it's still going. I don't think it's quite as active as it used to be, but it was a mecca for all uh, us guys, wasn't it? You know, we were all yeah. on there. And um, Oliver was the one who really sort of pushed me to write things for his website because he was very keen to have all this stuff on. And I never really thought about it. And I, I thought, yeah, OK. And, and if you read it, it's a little bit weak. I'm not a great writer. So it was a little bit, I went, you know, did this and I did that and I hadn't really thought about it when I wrote it. So, but, um, but it was interesting uh, looking back over it and people, uh, it, it sort of, I think it gave a little bit of hope to other people. They thought, oh, I'll have a go at making guitars. And I met so many people through that, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah, so it, it, you know, it led on to great things from there, really. Definitely did. And, and so for you obviously, you completed your guitar, um, 1995 yeah and then at what point did you find brianmayworld.com and then start speaking to oliver was that much long after or was that, that a few well, years or no well I, I obviously i've met brian in between there and uh, greg fryer um well greg fryer first obviously and then and then met brian um and then it was i think it was the early very early 2000s because there was a chat room before um the one that was set up on uh, Brian May World. I, I, I've been racking my brains to remember the name of it, but it was one of these ones that was on the web and it was all kind yeah. of like typed and everybody was typing yeah. messages. It was a bit hard work, but you could talk to someone in private and things like that as well. And I was on there and there were people from all over the world on there and some people who I still uh, talk to. And, um, yeah. and that's where I met a lot of the Japanese guys. So and and they were keen to talk to me, you know, because some of them were wanting to build guitars, but they had been yeah. into the guitar equipment. The Japanese really do it right when it comes to interviewing Brian, and you know, you've only got to look at those Japanese mags, and you think, why don't yeah. they do that? And it's only Simon Bradley's the only person who makes that effort, and God bless yeah. him, you know, because he's he's the only one. He's the only one here. You've done a lot for us for sure. So, yeah. Yeah, I think um, the name Gonzalo comes into my memory. Yeah, from Gonzalo the Plaza. Yep. So tornado. Yeah, it, yeah, it's all those names. It's I mean Gonzalo's actually mm -hmm. since um, I started the podcast. He's he's come out of the woodwork, and um, I message him every or well, quite frequently now because um, 
it's, it's yeah. really odd how it all, all goes full circle. But yeah, it's some of those names are like yeah, it is. You, you mentioned um, Tornado as well and his plans that were available. Yeah, I mean, again, Francesco when you were Stefano was his name, wasn't yeah, it? Francesco, Francesco Distano, Di yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you talk to the likes of um, people like Ian Angel and um, Matt yes. Hutchinson and all of those guys, yeah. and you say Tornado's plans, and it's just like instant nostalgia. It's <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is, absolutely, yeah. It's yeah, that's right. Crazy. But yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's, it's great. And it, we'll, we'll jump back to um, you meeting Greg and then Brian, but I mean, that's to me, that's the strength of the forum and the story about Brian's guitar is is obviously that the story in itself is fantastic and he built the guitar with his father and he's gone on to become a famous rock star and done all these wonderful yeah. things and written and played some of the you know definitive music of our time but yet off the side of that it's created this fantastic community of people all around the world that have a love of that instrument and through the power of the internet and people like yourself um posting up information and doing things we've all managed to become lifelong friends with our passion and share information and meet up and you know help professionals improve their builds and that, telling young people what you need to get Brian's equipment and it's just when you think of, of that to me that's just so mind-blowing that all of that came out of Brian and Harold deciding to make a guitar. I mean, it was almost inevitable he was going to be famous wasn't it really you know yeah. it's sort of you look at it and you think he's it had to be, didn't he? Because yeah, we just wouldn't have this music, you know. No, so, uh, yeah. for sure. But no, it's, it's just a nice thought. But um, you obviously you just said you met Greg. How, Greg Fryer restored the original guitar around 1998. How, how did you end up meeting Greg? Um, well, it was a just a good timing, I think. Um, when I first made the guitar, my, my friend um, who, who was a guitarist said to me, why don't you send Brian some photos of your guitar? You might get a letter from him or an autograph or something. I thought, ah, no. you know, I, I, I wasn't really, I'm not a kind of a star watcher. My wife likes all yeah. the famous people and all that sort of thing, but I, I've never been a star watcher. So I never really thought of it that way. And, um, and, and I, I didn't, I didn't bother. And then I think it was a couple of years later after that, after he said it, um, it was it was 1998. My mate said, do you ever send that letter to Brian? I said, no, he said, go on, send him a letter and see what he says. So I had a few nice photos taken of it. And uh, I just wrote this letter and just said, you know, sort of basically thanked him for the music and, and the enjoyment that I've had from it all over the years. And, um, and, and he inspired me to, build this guitar and I hope he didn't mind <laughs> the words to that effect and um, and, and uh, anyway I sent this letter and these photos and I just explained a little bit how I built it and I think I didn't want it to be too long because I thought it probably think oh god throw it in the bin you know uh, but no but anyway the next the very next day because I sent it first class post which means it normally gets there the next day and I had I knew where he lived I, I can't remember how I got his address but um, somebody must have somebody told me what it was, and, and I sent it to that address. And the next day, I got a phone call from Greg Fryer, and I didn't know who Greg Fryer was. And uh, I, I put my phone number on there, not not ever thinking Brian would ring. But um, uh, Greg rang me, and he said, "Hi, my name's Greg Fryer, and I'm working for Brian May." And I was thinking, "Who the hell's this guy? You know, do I know him?" And uh, and he said, um, "I said, oh right, okay." And he said. I'm, I'm, I don't know if you know, he said, but I'm restoring Brian's guitar. I said, oh, I didn't know it needed restoring. And then I thought to myself, well, it was built in 1963. It probably needs a, a bit of a stone on his fret or something, the frets or something like that. So anyway, he told me it was in really poor condition. And he said, we, Brian and I have been looking at your photographs. And I thought, wow, you know. And he said, um, you seem to have access to machinery. And we were wondering if you could possibly make us a few parts for the guitar. If we sent you some diagrams and things, would you be able to do it? And I said, well, I'm not a great machinist, but I have guys at work who, you know, are absolutely brilliant at it. And I'm sure they would be able to do it. Just let me know what you need and uh, I'll do what I can. Anyway, it didn't actually come to it. I think Brian was 
uh, sorry, Greg was looking at replacing some of the bridge parts, which were quite heavily worn, as you know, um, yeah. as we all know. Um, and I think they decided they weren't going to replace the worn parts. They were just going to secure it and make it you know, good, uh, playable again. And, uh, and anyway, Greg, uh, cut a long story short, Greg actually kept ringing me up. And we were having, we became quite friendly. I think he was just stuck in that little room where, when I actually went there, I didn't realize how small the room was. And he's beavering away at the guitar in this sort of airing cupboard, basically, you know, where you put your towels to dry them out. And, um, and he was working away in there and he had this great little workshop. And um, he, um, and he was working on all these different aspects. And, and uh, because he knew I was very interested in it, he, he was so nice. He rang me probably once a week and filled me in on what he'd done. And, it was, such, it was so nice and he was such a nice guy. And um, anyway, um, he, he, he sort of beavered through all the different things he had to do. And uh, he, he rang me up one day and he said, I'm in a bit of a pickle, really. He said, I'm in a bit of a, I've got a, a stumbling block. And I said, what's the problem? And he said, uh, I need to refinish the body and the neck because the original lacquer's badly crazed. You know, the, the rustings is very badly crazed. And I've rubbed it back through as far as I dare. And uh, he said, I need to seal the guitar. But he said, I've tried all these spray places, these spray shops, and I can't get anywhere to let me use the equipment. And I said, well, my stepfather um, has his own business. He, he is a sprayer. And he, funnily enough, he did flocking as well, which was, would have been really helpful <laughs> to us with all these fox phases. But anyway, um, I said, he has his own business. And you're more than welcome. I never even asked my stepdad. I just said, you're more than welcome to bring the guitar and the yeah. neck down and uh, use the equipment. And he said, are you sure? He said, has it got extraction and all this sort of thing? I said, yeah, it's all totally professional business. So he said, look, I'll run it by Brian. And he says, you can understand this guitar is priceless. And, and I said, no, I understand if he, if, if he doesn't feel comfortable with it, that's fine by me. Anyway, he rang me back about a week later and said, Brian said, you know, can we go ahead? We would be all right. I said, yeah, bring it. And I really wanted to ring Julian up and uh, tell him and get him there. But Greg really wanted to keep it private. I understood and I had to abide by that. And um, I, anyway, he uh, he came over with the body and the neck and he had this box with him with all his materials in uh, for doing the, um, the, the respraying. Obviously, we had the equipment and um, so and he had this box full of photographs loads of photographs and um while he was spraying I, he let me sort of go through all these photos of the guitar in pieces and it was just oh my god this is just a dream you know <laughs> and um so i just spent my time sort of like having a quick look at the guitar snapping some pictures and then going back and having a look at these photographs and greg was really really careful with it he he really worked hard on it he was so concerned about certain aspects of it and he was you know he, I know for a fact that he asked Brian everything before he did anything and you know he yeah. really worked hard on that so anyway after that he, he took it back he said you might not hear from me for a couple of weeks but um, as soon as it's all back together I'll give you a shout and let you know how it goes so anyway a couple of weeks later or three weeks later he ran me up and he said do you want to hear it and uh, this is Greg. And Greg played the We Were Rock You solo down the phone. I was thinking, oh, my God, this sounds perfect. You know, even though Greg doesn't, isn't Brian, he did yeah. a really good version of it. And it just sounded brilliant. I was thinking, oh, my God, I was listening to this down the phone. And it just <laughs> sounded like Brian's guitar, you know. And um, so that was that. And um, I uh, got a phone call from Greg. I think it was probably about a month later. And he said, um, Brian's um, asked me to give you a call. And uh, he said, we were wondering if you'd like to come down for the day. And I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. So he, uh, the, with my wife and my son, because I only had my son at the time, Jamie, were invited to go and see Brian at his home. And uh, um, But then Greg rang me and said, uh, Brian won't be there, I'm afraid, because he's got, business and i said well that's okay i understand but he said still come down you know you can have a go on the guitar and that sort of thing and when we got there um uh, brian uh, greg let me in uh, the, to the house electronic gates and we went up to the house and we were sitting in the kitchen having a chat and uh, and he said to me by the way brian's here i thought really 
And uh, and I, he said, and I thought, oh, I won't tell my son because it'd be quite funny to watch his face. Anyway, I heard this sort of clomp, 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 you know, coming through. And there's Brian in a pair of shorts and his T-shirt and he's clogged and he's just standing in the doorway. And I went, oh, hello, Brian. He went, hello. You know, my son was like, just sat there absolutely wide-eyed, <laughs> didn't know what to say. It was just hilarious. So, But he was such a gentleman. Brian was such a nice person. Um, I, I, did, have you met him yourself, uh, Brian? I'm not, no, I haven't. I've, right. uh, it's one of those, it's, I'll it, take the advice of many, don't meet your hero, but I've never been... I've been places where he is, and he comes to Sidmouth quite regularly, um, but I've never been there oh, when right. he's there. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't say no if he phoned up and said, John, can we record an episode of the podcast? That's for sure. Yeah, um, yeah that would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. But, um, Maybe it'll happen. Uh, you know, I hope well, it does. I hope it does for you. You never know. But, no, I, I mean, everyone I speak to about him who's met him says how wonderful he is and how, how he is, oh. how he comes across. And, you know, I don't know. Like, I... Yeah, I would probably be quite. I'd find it quite difficult to talk to him probably to start with, just because of who he is and how much of my own life he's inspired. And, and absolutely, and yeah. Sort of out. So, how did you deal with that? Because that must be a bit like, oh, he's actually here, and then there he is. That's the guy that plays the guitar that he built. That I. Yeah. Well, Greg dropped me in the deep end, really. Didn't he? <laughs> you know, he sort of just walked in. <laughs> it's almost as if he was just going to walk in with the rest of the band, you know. But. Yeah. Uh, but but I think that my, my, in a way, I was sort of relieved that Brian wasn't going to be there. I know that sounds stupid, but I thought to myself, well, I have a great respect for Brian. He's such a, he, he appeared to be a really lovely guy and very sensitive and all that. And I had a lot of respect for him. I just, I just liked him because he wasn't full of rubbish when he spoke. He, he really thought before he spoke. And I liked that. And uh, um, when I found out he was there, I thought, oh, my God, I hope he's not one of these, oh, it's all rock and roll, man, and all, you know, and all that. So I'm thinking, oh, my God, I hope he just doesn't destroy what, how I've always yeah. felt he was. But he was exactly as I thought he was. He was just this really nice, down-to-earth guy, very, very sensitive, and um, very, it was really nice to my son, and... Uh, and he just spoke to him like he was his own. You know, he was just really gentle with him. And and he had this room at the back of his kitchen where he had some um, those computer games and, things, you know, pinball machines and stuff for his kids. And he let Jamie go in there. And uh, he was in his element. And it was, it was great. <laughs> ping, ping, ping. <laughs> we were all talking guitars, you know. But, uh, yeah, no, he, he was brilliant. He was so nice. And he wanted to know. He, he asked me a lot of questions about me as a as what I did and spoke to my wife but my wife was quite eager to go off and have a look around the local area so she yeah. left us to it she was bored obviously with the guitar yeah. stuff <laughs> and um anyway Brian said um where's this guitar then you know because Greg had asked me to bring my guitar down and I was yeah. thinking oh my god he doesn't want to see that surely and um so and he said Greg go and get mine and so Greg went off and got the real thing and my hands were getting sweaty and I was shaking and I was thinking oh my god how am I going to handle this and anyway I got my guitar out and I, and he said put it on the table so I put it on his his table in his kitchen and it was a weird it seemed like 15 to 20 minutes he just stood there looking at it and he was sort of moving his head and looking around and pressed the tremolo arm down a couple of times and looked at the rollers and and then he picked it up and he went that's really nice, he said like that. <laughs> that soft voice, you know, said, that's really nice. And I, I was saying, I said, no, it's all right, you know. He said, no, no, he said, you, he said, how did you do that? And I said, oh, I, I used this and that to make that. He said, yeah, yeah, that's how I did it. And um, what about it? How did you do that? How did you get the details? Then I mentioned Julian, and he yeah. knew who J Julian was straight away. And he said, oh, Julian yeah. Hemingway. I thought, has Julian been here or something? He hasn't told me, you know. And, uh, and he knew. Um, in fact, when I told Julian after I'd met him, he was really surprised that he remembered his name. And I said, no. I said, he just off the top of his head, Julian Hemingway. I said, he remembers yeah. you really well. So it was kind of nice. And I said, we live in the same town. That's where John's from, you know, John Deacon. Yeah. And uh, 
so yeah, it was quite it was quite interesting, and uh, he he was all over it, and he sat there sort of playing chords on it and things like that, and then Greg walked in with the real thing, and I was a little bit surprised because obviously I modelled my guitar colour on the all the photos that we'd seen because we had no other method of knowing exactly what it looked like. And when it was on stage, it looked bright red, so mine looked like a sort of a more or less bright red mahogany body. But um, his was more brown, as you know, and yeah. uh, I was a bit shocked and miffed, you know, a bit annoyed that I hadn't got the colour right. So mine looked like a lollipop and his looked like a piece of wood, you know. Yeah. And um, so anyway, he he was playing his and I sat there just sort of strumming a D chord and kind of looking at him and thinking, right, I'm not going to let go of this because if it hits the floor, I'm out of here, you know. <laughs> and uh, I just wobbled the tramp. So in fairness, I never actually plugged it in. I never plugged the guitar yeah. in or anything because we didn't have the option to do that at the time. And Greg sat with it. Uh, sorry, Greg and Brian sat with us for um, probably two, two, two and a half hours or something like that. Yeah. And then he said, I'm really sorry, I've got to go. And Brian left and that was fine. You know, shook hands, gave us a copy of his new album before it came out. And um, my son dropped me in the proverbial bin uh, because he said, oh, dad's got that record already. And I'd got yeah. this bootleg that I picked up from someone else. <laughs> well, no, you can't say that. And Brian said, oh, do you collect bootlegs? And I said, yeah, I do really. I'm sorry about that. And he said, no, have you got this one? Or have you got that one? I'm looking for this one. If you ever find them, let me know. And he was a real avid collector of bootlegs. But then before he left, I don't know if it was a sarcastic comment or something. He said, here's the proper album. He yeah. <laughs> gave me, signed the album, <laughs> gave me a copy of the real one. You know, thanks, Brian. And I'm sorry about <laughs> the other one. Um, but, um, yeah, so anyway, um, then he said to Greg, like, he said, go plug them in. And I thought, oh, wow. So we went into this other room where, and I walked in, and there must have been about 15 <laughs> AC30s just rat. I mean, you've seen the photo. They're all kind yeah. of rammed deep up against the wall. And, I was, and Greg said, oh, we'll get one of these out. And, of course, Greg had his guitars there. And uh, so we got, I got to play his guitars, which, I mean, they were like pieces of furniture. They, you know, antique furniture. They were stunning yeah. piece, of, piece of work. And um, uh, so anyway, yeah, so we had this AC30, which is a purple one. And I'd brought my treble booster with me. And I thought, I'm determined to plug it in to see if it's right. You know, not that I didn't trust Julian. I just wanted to know it sounded right. And Greg had his prototype one, the one with the yellow fryer on it. Um, on the top of the silver box, yep. plugged in, boom, you know, the sound was fantastic playing through Greg's guitars. And I plugged mine in. I thought, oh, it doesn't sound that bad, actually. It sounds pretty similar, even though I had Kent Armstrong's. And, um, excuse me. And then uh, what happened then was uh, we did a little bit of playing around. Greg and I traded guitars and we were playing different things. And he said, uh, do you want to see the Deke amp? Well, obviously, at that point, I'd never, ever seen it in my life. I don't think anybody had. We'd all heard about it, and we knew it was some kind of little boxy speaker, but other than that, I didn't know anything. And he brought it in, and I thought, that's a hi-fi speaker, you know. And I'd seen that style, obviously, growing up in the 60s and the 70s. That type of thing was in everybody's house. And um, he got the battery out, plugged it in, and I just sat there on the floor. It was on top of the amp, and I sat, I don't know, maybe about four or five feet away from the amp, just playing around, and it just had this fantastic and this is brilliant you know and he said it's great isn't it i said yeah it's brilliant so that was my first experience with the d camp as well so it was a real major day for me it was a real major day it was a hell of a lot to take in and i'm trying to cram all this info in to relate to julian when i got back you know about the guitar and you know so it was a lot to get in their head but yeah amazing amazing and then greg showed me the prototypes he was working on and he had a couple of cabs that he'd made uh, and the circuits. Uh, but we didn't get to try those because they were still working on them. But, um, yeah, amazing day, amazing day. That's, how, that's really how I got to meet Brian, you know. I mean, wow. I mean, what a lovely story. And, you know, what do you say? Did you sleep that night when you got home? Because No. No. <laughs> well, actually... <laughs> Not really. No, I was I was hyper. Uh, I, I was a bit buzzed when I got back, and I think the first thing I did the next day was take my films in to get them developed. You know, because yeah. I wanted them back, and I paid for the faster service and all that. Yeah. You know, so afraid I wouldn't get them back. 
But funnily enough, because I'd driven down to London to see him, I had this old Vauxhall Astra estate. And uh, I think it was about three days after the head gasket went on it. And I'm thinking, my God, I'm glad it didn't go on the M25 yeah. when I was on the way back. You know? yeah. So it brought me down to earth when I got home then, you know. But, uh, I yeah. can imagine you were, you would have been, got, I mean, buzzing when you got home. And oh, I mean, did you start yeah. writing notes or did you, did, did you get pen to paper and start writing things down? Or was it more just, oh, I did. The photos? Um, well, I, I did. I did. Because obviously I had Brian's guitar in my hand. I made a few sort of mental notes of certain things. Um, and I, I remember thinking how flat the fingerboard was, um, you know, that it didn't seem to be much relief. And, um, the you know, the string heights were pretty standard, that type of thing. But you yeah. could really see the, the damage. The pickups were quite battered up by them, but even more so later on. But... Um, and the and the wear on the bridge pieces and things like that, but it, it just it just felt great. I mean, I was thinking the neck, you know, for a homemade guitar, I was thinking the neck just felt absolutely glorious. And Greg had done a brilliant job of the finish, you know, the, the work he did on that back. The back was absolutely horrendous, and um, so, it was really badly damaged. So, you obviously, in a short space of time, relatively, you were able to have seen the guitar in pieces in your living room. On the sofa, yeah. on Greg's, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. the famous photos. Yeah, when Greg's Greg stayed over, shift. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you were able well, to see that, it. And that's like that. Sorry, go on. Sorry, you, sorry, I'm talking over you. Go on. No, no, not at all. You go. It's, you're far more. It's, you, you, oh, oh, we'll cut that bit yeah, out. Yeah, Greg had made um, that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Greg, when Greg was spraying the guitar, he'd made this kind of stand. Um, and it was quite good, actually, because I made one myself afterwards when I was doing my own uh doing my other uh, painting on guitars and things in later years and um he basically had two posts with these little um brackets on the end and he, and the wood was screwed into the neck pocket and he used it to be able to spin it around and he had a, a metal bar screwed into the uh, strap button on the end of the guitar at that end so he could turn it around spray it and um after it was done i was thinking well how are you going to get it back without it you know the finish getting damaged and he said oh you know it'll be fine but uh, i was putting greg up because we didn't finish till three o'clock in the morning and it was really really early hours and uh so i i said to greg by all means you can stay over you know but it's at our place so i had this sort of um prawn colored <laughs> settee we want of a better color um settee and uh, the guitar sat on this the neck and the uh, the body sat on this uh this settee for the night while Greg camped down on a, an inflatable bed I think we had for him in the front room he, he wouldn't let it out of his sight which is understandable and uh, and then there, I had that caption while, my, while Brian's guitar gently weeps when I first yes, put yeah. the, uh, sleeps sorry while, yeah. while Brian's guitar gently sleeps uh, for the photo yeah so that uh, that spent the night there and uh, yeah that, that was quite I remember I mean, I remember seeing that photo and being like, wow, he's had it in parts <laughs> in his house. And wow, imagine getting to see the inside and, and seeing it. But you would have been able to, I'm guessing, because Greg fin refinished it with Rustin's, didn't he? Rustin's plastic coating. The he more did, modern. yeah. He hated the stuff. He didn't like yeah. it at all. Yeah. And he actually he sprayed it on, didn't he? Which is different to how Brian initially yes. applied it, I think, which yeah. was with brush. Um, yeah. But you would have seen it before... Greg sprayed it and then yeah about six to seven weeks later fully reconstructed when you went to Brian's um did he had he did Greg finished it at that point completely or was he still doing bits and pieces to it um yeah it was virtually finished uh, he'd assembled it it was playable um and the only thing he hadn't got were the pickups around um uh, at that time because he'd been trying to make some but they're as you probably know, they're not easy to make by hand. And um, so I said, well, my brother is a sign maker. He works for a sign making company and um, they got a computer router. And uh, so I said, we could probably make you some um, if you just let us know what material you want to make it out of and whatever. So Greg did this nice little diagram on a, on a piece of card and um, he sent me it through. 
and I gave it to my brother and my brother made them out of three mil perspex, black perspex, same as the scratch yeah. plate in effect. And he made a whole, I, I think about 15 or 20 of them uh, out of a sheet and we sent them off to him. And then Greg um, beveled all the edges and everything, thinned them out to whatever thickness he wanted. And they're still on there, I believe. Uh, yeah. I think he had a few spare sets anyway, but yeah. So uh, they, they were sent to Brian just to finish off the guitar. That's pretty cool as well, Mark, knowing that some of your, your brother's handiwork or your handiwork to get to your brother, um, is now on the yeah. guitar and it's been been around the world again a few times with your pickup surrounds on it. It has. Well, I was looking at them the other day on a few pictures and I was thinking, wow, they're really battered. I mean, and, and yeah. Perspex is really hard to sort of yeah. dig into really, isn't it? But it's, it's gouged as the pickups, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so uh, quite interesting. Well, I know it's, that whole thing though around, I mean, you watch Brian, he has quite a light touch with the pick or with the sixpence yeah. in his fingers. But the guitar takes an absolute hammering from it. <laughs> <laughs> I used um, to think it's that, quite, yeah. It's quite interesting because if you hold the sixpence as lightly as you see him hold it, or in Starlix, for example, because that's the go-to where you can actually really see his technique up close. And Absolutely. even on the... Um, but from back in the day, it's quite hard to get as much purchase to actually really w damage the guitar with a sixpence and hold it that lightly without it flinging off and smacking you in the face. Because uh, every time I yeah, try it, it's yeah. a string and falls out over. But I mean, Brian must just play it and 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 play it. And that's why it's just worn down over so much time. Can I hold it there for a second and put the light on? Of course on, you can. It's getting a bit yep. dark in here. Yeah, that's no worries. Second. That'd be better. Everybody will walk away now that can see me. <laughs> <laughs> there well, we are. I'm sorry about that. Drink as well, which is lovely. Ah, um, <laughs> nice. Very, very fortunate. Cheers. Yeah, so the, the guitar literally went from um, your sofa to then touring the world again in not too, too, <laughs> too short order. Um, yeah, that's true, because um, I think we we met um, Brian in the, uh, it was a bank holiday, I think, around that time. I can't remember exactly when it was. He, he played at Birmingham uh, in the October of that year, 98. I think it was October. Yeah. And we went to see him there, the National Indoor Arena. And that was uh, the um, Brian May Band, as it was yeah. then. So, yeah, we, w we went to see that. And, uh, yeah, so he was out there playing, using it. Yeah, so it's great, yeah. And, and, uh, was it much, I mean, it must have been interesting seeing the guitar before the spray and then afterwards and watching that sort of rustins go off and then seeing it a few weeks all polished up and ready and put back together again. Yeah, uh, well, the, the thing I remember about that um, was that when it was in the workshop, um, ready to when he was preparing it to be sprayed the colour of the guitar I, I sort of looked at it when he got it out and I thought that's not the red special because the, the colour was completely different it looked like yeah. um, uh, like a, a, a cherry like a dark cherry black cherry kind of colour to it it was really strange colour and because obviously it had gone through it rubbed it back as far as he dared to get rid of some of the lacquer and obviously it, it, it was sort of scored in that sense, you know, keyed. And it had a, a really strange look about it. But when he flashed it over with the lacquer, when he first put the first, you know, few blows of lacquer on it, it just went boom, like that. it just went yeah. red, you know, and you knew it was the guitar and the colour was there then. I was thinking, oh, my God, this looks brilliant. And it is the guitar, you know, he hasn't brought some fake along, you know. And... Uh, it was really strange because the, the colour looked really different. In fact, what I ought to do is uh, I'll dig out my old photos because you know, some of the photos you can actually see the before and after colour. Yeah. And uh, I'll dig that out. I'll have to put them up on the forum at some point. Um, I think anyone that, I mean, anyone that's used Rustins recently, and it's a very interesting substance to use, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I used it on my own and I, you know, you can, I can attest to the fact that as soon as when you get the first few coats on and then you 
key it up for the next few it changes the hue slightly because the light goes through it slightly differently and then yeah. as soon as you apply another coat it, it changes again and i mean the guitar and we all know the guitar to be red because red special and in many photos it looks orange and then it looks brown and then it it's sort of ever changing color it's very difficult to try and replicate that look it all depends what angle it is at the time they take yeah. the photo like you say because you get this yeah. three-dimensional uh grain movement as well which is yeah. unique and there is a hint of orange in it you yeah. know and i think greg put that down to the lead or something that yeah. was in the original um stain or the uh, well i don't think it was in the um brustings i think it was in the stain the fern glass. glass yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah you wouldn't, want to, you wouldn't want to drink it let's put it that way no <laughs> No, it's so interesting, Mark, and what a fantastic, you know, experience to have had as well. And, you know, great timing to have your, again, your mate pushing you to send them a letter. Oh, yeah. You must, know, you must have been like pinching yourself going, did I really just all this last three or four months happen? Because my mate made while. me send a letter. Yeah, it did take a while to sink in. It was a bit strange. Uh, you know, meeting one of your heroes. I mean, I, I've not particularly wanted to meet many famous people, but. Brian was one. George Harris had been another. I never met George. Um, and I've met Donovan, who was one of my idols. So a lot of people don't particularly like him, but I, I like him as a musician. I've met him. He's a nice guy. But um, most, most, the most famous people I've, I've had the opportunity to speak to all seem to be quite nice people. I, I haven't come across one yet that I've thought, oh, you're an idiot. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it, Just, it did take but, a while. Yeah. No, um, but a great story. And, you know, what a fantastic thing for your son, Jamie, as well, to have, have met Brian and then got to play on his pinball machine. And yeah, that's every oh, kid's dream, isn't it? He's never forgot it. No. <laughs> so I, I know from then on, you and Greg have stayed good friends. And Greg's obviously, you know, not obviously, because not everyone's been around, but you and Greg then stayed good friends. And I think. Greg used to send you various bits of um, treble boosters and bits and bobs to test out and try. And he did, yeah. I mean, Greg's Greg's a really good pedal maker, no doubt. He's made some fantastic uh, pedals, and uh, he's sent over various different prototypes and stuff over the years. Because uh, Peter Michalowski, uh, myself, uh, Martin, Martin Pitcher. Um, yep. and amongst other people he sent them to to try it out and the thing about Greg is he likes to he likes to do his uh, research and get honest opinions on things and um, you know, uh, most of the time I find them great but I mean a couple of times we sort of said could do with a little bit more here and there and he takes it all on board and he's very interested in it and the stuff he's produced is good so he's, he has he has done that over the years you mentioned as well you got to play his guitars was that all three of them or was that just the did he have all three with him in Gorms? yeah um i i played well in fact um he had all the guitars there when i was at brian's and um he let me he, he actually gave me john and paul and he said to me at the time we if you could have either of those i'm thinking oh my god he's going to give me one of these guitars and he didn't know <laughs> but he, he said um, which which one would you prefer out of the two so he said a b them and tell me which one you like and i played them both and i found i thought that john was the nicest one of the two i own they sounded very very close to each other the only difference was to me to my ear was that the paul was brighter and John was warmer. And he said, Brian picked John. I said, all oh, right. And uh, he said, probably for the same reason you did, the, the warmth. Yeah. And um, so Brian asked Greg to take Paul back with him, as it, uh, you know, for him to yeah. keep. As a, you know. and, um, he, and he had the George Burns there. Now, that was a nice guitar as well. That was an interesting guitar because it was very different from the others. So, sim very similar construction in all ways but um it had a few little tweaks to it it had hotter pickups um as i recall um a longer headstock but only a little bit just so that the strings went across in a straight line rather than sort of yeah. fan out slightly and yeah. um and also the rollers were bigger 
because he thought the bigger mass, greater mass, more sustain. And um, but that that was a lovely guitar. That that was really nice. I know Brian likes that for his drop D stuff, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that great great guitars. So you've been again right place, right time. You got yeah. to try out these things that uh, yeah. we only see in pictures the DQ, now. The real one, the yeah. AC30s. Yeah, gosh. Like, like all your Christmases at once, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was very big, very big Christmas present. That. Yeah, and then you obviously come back, and um, we've already talked about the Brian May World Forum and all from Oliver Taminga. Um, you must stumble across that at some point and then get in touch with Oliver or Oliver gets in touch with you and and yeah. starts to post up about Red Specials and your experience and it changes from the web chat to the, the forum that it is no longer there but it has become the forum, the web forum now with the various iterations over the last yeah. 20 years. Um, and you mentioned that before that happened you were on the web chat and you met a lot of people from Japan. Yes one of those being someone that ended up putting you in touch or you work with them, I believe to work with KZ or KZ, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, well, I, I say KZ, but um, uh, his, yeah. uh, I call him Kazoo. That's, I think that's yeah. actually his nickname. He always used to say, call me Kazoo, but um, I always refer to him as Kazutaka, but um, uh, Kazoo or Kazutaka. But um, yeah, um, I, I was one of the very first per- people I met in uh, of the Japanese fans um, was a guy called Hiramitsu Shimoka. And he was a massive fan. Uh, he, I think he had a kid's guitar, you know, the kids make. And he also yep. had a, another kid's, which was like um, an unfinished one. Um, and uh, Hi- Hiramitsu, a f- really nice guy. Um, we communicated a lot, and he told me about Kazutaka, and um, and Kazutaka had trained to to make guitars. He he had done training as a, as a luthier. That's what he was doing, and um, and he introduced me to uh, quite a few um, uh, people who were massive fans of Red Special, um, but in particular Kazutaka was one of them. Shiro Akagi, you may remember him. Um, yep, I know that name. And uh, there was uh, Daizo Takuda, who's yep. a very close friend of uh, Kazutaka, another fantastic guy. And these people were all very, you know, into the Red Special. And uh, anyway, the first guitar that Kazutaka had Red Special that he made that I'd ever seen was the white one. And uh, and I think it had strap pickups in it or that type of thing. But it was it was a really quite a nicely made guitar. And I'd never heard it played, but uh, I'd seen some lovely photos of it and stuff. And um, Hiramitsu put me in touch with Kazutaka. And we started talking about the Red Special. And he, um, this was over the internet, early days of the internet. And we were sort of showing each other like little hand-drawn sketches and stuff because it was, you know, I didn't really understand paintbrush and things like that, you know, yeah. to draw pictures and not at that point. And, uh, you know, me and technology don't really go very well. But um, anyway, um, um, Hiramitsu came to London and he asked if I could possibly meet with him. And I said, yeah, of course, I'd love to meet you. So I got on a train and went down to the hotel where he was staying. And um, he, um, he had this plan, the big plan. And uh, I'd already sent a copy of Julian's over to them, I think, at the time, or my plan, because I, I adapted Julian's plan slightly because I'd, uh, when when I got Julian's plan, I got a little bit more information that Julian didn't have at the time, which obviously I shared with him. So I redrew it and I sent them my updated version. And um, anyway, he came back with a full size plan of a KZ Red Special. And it, I mean, it was brilliant. The drawing was brilliant. It was all, all precise, very, very precise yeah. drawing. And um, but he got some of the cavities wrong that I knew about and so i corrected it he said to me Here, here's a pencil you know change whatever you like and i changed the some the interior designs a little bit and explained to him what what they were doing and how they were and um because i was meeting him 
and uh, they they were sort of wanting a little bit of information on the tremolo. They grasped the design of it, but they just wanted a bit of info. And I thought, well, I work in an engineering company. I made them one. I made it by hand, the complete tremolo yeah. system. Um, and I put it on that in a similar way to what Brian did in in the book, uh, the uh, Simon's book. There's a plug for Simon. Um, the um, the tremolo system. I'd made the whole thing, and I made it up on a wooden plint, if you like, as a yeah. working trem, tremolo arm and everything. Turned it all up at work and made it for him, and made him a truss rod to show the how it wrapped around the bolt and everything. And uh, so they were they were complete working parts. And I gave them to Hiramitsu to take back with him as a sort of a present, really. And um, so really, it sort of started from there. And uh, Kazutaka was very keen to make them. And of course, there wasn't all that sort of problem in a way with making red specials at that time, because there were few and far between. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it was very early days. It was a different time back then as well. Cause it was. I, I, that makes us all sound old and it's like, oh, back in my day. But it, it really was a different it time. Was. And it's not like today where if you want something, you can go on Amazon and buy it immediately and it'll be at your door within 24 hours. It was, if you want something, then, you, you know, if you can't find it, you have to make it or you don't get it. Or if you do want it, you might have to go to a shop and buy it yeah. and then they might have to order it and you might have to wait six months and get a telephone call or a letter saying it's in. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it just was a different time, wasn't it? It mm. was. And people were, so, I mean, people loved Brian. We all loved yeah. him and we, you know, we loved his guitar and we had a lot of respect for him. I know, I know it's sort of, the class it is disrespectful a lot more these days with regards to building your own guitar. But at that time, it was very early days in the community and, you know, and there was just a few people, you know, yeah. involved in that. I think it's um, an innocence back then as well. And, uh, yeah. you know, there, the group was so much so much smaller. Um, I think it's probably a lot of people, as we found on the podcast, doing a similar thing or having a similar sort of journey to everyone else mm. in their own way in a different part of the country. But um, we weren't all connected and information wasn't so easy to share and, you know i forget how many it was like a couple hundred people if that on the forum when i joined in the early 2000s and yeah it just was a different time and it was different expectations and i think every snippet of information we all shared with each other didn't we it was yeah. one of those things <laughs> which was good you know but i mean in kesataka's case um he, he, he was he i've got photos going back right to the beginning of kesataka building his guitars and he always used to send me these photos of, of, of uh, sort of testing assemblies and how things went together. And he was so methodical. I was just absolutely blown away by him. And it, he actually built a full guitar without veneer. And you could see how the tremolo was assembled and everything was all screwed together and all it was all removable. It was like a sort of a working demo, you know, yeah. and that, I mean, that was quite amazing. And, um, and he sent me a few little designs and things. He said, does that look right? So, well, no, maybe if you change that, no, that's perfect. And, you know, and it went on for quite some time, but he eventually produced the KZ Pro, which was his first yeah. one. And uh, he sent me prototype number two, which is the one I've got. Um, and um, it's the only KZ Pro that I have. And I, I was completely stunned when it arrived. I was thinking, I opened the case and it was like, you know, it's like your guitar when you first opened it. You sort of, yeah. it's the smell and everything that comes out with yeah. it, isn't it? You know, and, and it was just that a moment of, wow, you know. And I just plugged it in. It played straight out of the case. It was still in tune and everything. It was yeah. just amazing. But the idea was for me to, he asked me to look over it and even take it apart and just have a look at it and see if there was anything that could be made better or done better. And I think that's always something we all know about Kazutaka is he's a real perfectionist. Everything he yeah. does is extremely precise and he treats them like kids. He treats them like babies, every guitar he makes. And um, anyway, I was just kind of blown away with the whole thing. And we spoke about a few issues which we rectified and uh, it sort of went on really. And, he, as he as he started to develop them, he started to get a few people interested in buying them. Well, of course, I had the only one in the UK, and yeah. although it was a prototype and probably not quite as accurate as 
the later ones became. Um, it, it's a great working model. And Martin Pitcher was the very first person to come and have a look at it. Because you know, obviously I knew Martin and Julian, of yeah. course, Julian came over. He loved it as well. You know, he was quite amazed by it. And uh, Julian came down, uh, sorry, uh, Martin came down like a rocket and he came down to see me and uh, he played it for four hours solid in my back room and I couldn't get it out of his hands. <laughs> and I just I thought, God, I'm not going to get this back off him, you know. Yeah. And, and Martin ordered one and he was yeah. on the strength of that. And he was very, very keen because it, it was really the, the first accurate was, red special. And when was that, Mark? Was that 2000s, early 2000s? Uh, well, mine was 2002, my second yeah. prototype. So um, he, I think he, I, I can't remember the exact date, but I think it was around about 2000, between 2000 and 2001 when he was doing work, sort of working on assembly and all that sort of thing. And he made his first prototype, which he, he kept at the workshop. Then he sent the second one over to me, which was a bit better yeah. than the previous one and whatever. Um, so that was 2002. What, yeah. between 2001, 2002? 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's nearly vintage. <laughs> nearly vintage now, yeah. isn't it? Thinking about it. <laughs> God, don't say things like that. I make me feel old now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's when I, it's around the time I joined BrianMayWorld.com forum. So, you know, mm. it's crazy, really, because, um, yeah, it makes, I mean, I always consider myself as a youngster in the group. But <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. But no, we're you? You're a veteran now. But um, I know, it's scary. <laughs> but, but then, you see, obviously, the Japanese people were, were contacting me through their friends and sort of being introduced. And uh, I got... Um, I got it very friendly with a guy called Yas Funiyama, Yasuhiro yeah. Funiyama, the guitarist from KC Rai, and Snoochie, yeah. who's the female Freddie um, in that band. And I got friendly with them, and, and Yas had got one of Kazutaka's first uh, guitars, and he was putting it to great use because they were really well known for doing like full gigs. I mean, they used to do yeah. the whole Hammersmith Odeon, you know, unbelievable. I've got a few DVDs here that they sent me over the years of the concert. It's just amazing. It's just great. And, um, and that's, he's the person I got my Fox from because he had right. two or three. And yeah. um, he, we did a trade. I forget what we traded for now, but we did a trade for that. So I got Fox and he got what he wanted sort of thing. And uh, so these were all like early customers of Kazutaka. And, uh, and even Nigel, Nigel Knight came to visit me. Um, yeah. I got speaking to him somehow on the forum or the internet or somewhere. And uh, he, he was interested and he, he wanted to have a look at one. So I said, well, you're welcome to come and have a look. And that was the first time I met Nigel. He came over and he brought an amp that he had made, which was kind of like, I think it was a sort of like an AC-15 type of amp. That was amazing. It sounded fantastic. And um, while he was there, he liked it. And he actually bought one on the strength of, my, my yeah. prototype and um i gave him the diagram for the one watt mullard um because he was kind of interested in that at the time and he blames me now for the project for the deke because if i had to send him that one watt mullard and he made it because he made it he said yeah. no, i wouldn't have been stuck with making deekies <laughs> 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 he blames me for making deekies but uh anyway they're brilliant so yeah no Watch nigel out. nigel's brilliant too i think <clears throat> I think I'm right in thinking he, he was looking for something to demo, to use to demo the DK amp and all the the, the the things he ended up making and demoing. Yeah, and I think that out. probably was it. But uh, yeah, he, I mean, he seemed to like it. So yeah. yeah, no, it's a fantastic guitar. I've played your guitar on a couple of occasions as well, yeah. and it's a very nice. I mean, I've seen a few KZ Pros over the years, and and my memory tells me they weren't called KZ Pro originally. It was just a KZ Red Special. And then, yes, I think it was originally. And uh, Kazutaka came up with the idea of the name. He wanted to yeah. give it a sort of a more, you know, uh, appealing name, if you like. Yeah. Because mm. then off the back of the Pro, a bit later on, he then came out with the KZ Junior, which was the mahogany body. Yes. Which which went down quite well and there was a limited number of those i think it wasn't limited to start with but he started making them and then i think brian not brian but bmg or the brian may organization got in touch and they started making them with fryer as the bmg supers 
Yeah, that's that's true. Um, he made the ju- the KZ Junior, and um, and it was quite interesting because he, he he contacted me because he had one one guitar that he had trouble with, one of his KZ Juniors, and a customer had sent it back to him, asked him if he could have a look at it, and it wouldn't stay in tune. And um, so he said, "Look, I haven't got the time to." deal with this if i send it to you could you strip it down and find out why it isn't working so i said yeah of course you know no problem and uh, so anyway he sent the guitar over to me and it was the mahogany one because he did, he did various colors of course um yeah. and um it, he sent the mahogany one over and uh, that was the one that was playing out anyway I, I took it apart and um, i actually found what the problem was and uh there was a little bit of movement in the uh where the bolts go in the, the bolt retainer plate yeah. and um so um and this was one of the very first models that he'd done he only i think he'd only only made a couple of them at the time and uh anyway i, I found what the problem was i cured it and uh, by uh, i can't remember exactly what i did now i think i, I sort of dribbled a bit of aerodite in or something like that to lock it into position and there was something like that. So anyway, so what he did was he made sure that that slot that he sat in was absolutely dead tight. And he never had any yeah. trouble after that. So I said, well, what do you want me to do with the guitar? He said, leave it with you. Um, and um, then if anybody's interested, they can try KZ Junior. It's already in the country. So that was fine. Yeah. Anyway, I got it all working and it was working fine, put new strings on it. And a few people came to visit me who um, um, were interested in the Junior. And uh, so I said, yeah, come over, have a look, you know, whatever. And I think on the back, on the strength of it being in the UK, I think I sort of sold three for him. But I sold 15 of the KZ Pros overall because <laughs> they, they were obviously more popular because people yeah. wanted as much accuracy as they could at the yeah. time. So that was early days. And I just felt pleased that I could help him, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, but then... Um, then uh, Kazataka contacted me and said that uh, Greg had been in contact with him. And Greg had been doing a little bit of homework with Brian and mentioned this KZ Junior as a middle model for his range. And he seemed yeah. very keen, but obviously he needed to see one. So uh, Kazataka said to me, would you, would you be able to send it to Brian? And I said, yeah, why? And he said, oh, he's interested. He, you know, I might be able to get my foot in the door making an intermediate model. So I packaged it up in the case, sent it through to Greg, um, and um, the rest is history, really, because they, they yeah. Brian loved it and suggested a few changes to the design, which Greg and um, Kazutaka worked on on behalf of Brian, and they produced the Super. So the Super came from the KZ Junior. Yeah. yeah. Remember it quite well from KZ's website because it was on the back in the day before there was loads of photos and you could go on his website and he had all of the different makings of and different bits and pieces and you could click on and then the big release on the forum about oh he's doing the juniors now and there was the different colors and yeah all the comments and you know it's a a really exciting time to be around really because it really was the birth of what we now have and know and to have been there when all that was going on was quite exciting um yeah to then see what it's become now but yeah, and I remember then the picture of Kazutaka with um, Greg in his workshop. I think they're both holding guitars and um, whatnot. And it's, it's like going down memory lane, really. It's Yeah, it's interesting because I remember contacting a few people like Peter in Sweden. And I said, you've got to get one of these KZ Pros, matey. You know, you need to get yeah. one of these KZ Pros. And I can't remember which way around it, 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 uh, it came because um, I... Uh, I can't remember. Did he come over here? Uh, yeah, I met um, Peter in London at one point, and I took my home maid along. Uh, that so that was earlier than that. I can't remember how Peter. I can't, I think Peter. I think Peter actually played my guitar and bought it on the strength of that, or he just bought one because I told him he got to buy. One. Yeah, <laughs> Peter Mitchell. Sounds like Peter. He'll remember, he'll remember. Yeah. Um, but anyway, he bought one as well, and he was another guy who just loved it. And uh, yeah. so quite a few people went for them, and it, it was a popular time. Yeah. Definitely. And, it, I mean, apart from just trying to think who was around at that point, I mean, yeah, there wasn't really another high-end, very close replica at that point. Obviously, no. Um, 
around the time I came around, Steve Turpin of RS Guitars was building yes. Red Specials. Yeah. Um, who you also knew. And uh, yeah, seemed... I did actually. Yeah, <laughs> I was quite friendly with um, Steve Turpin. Uh, again, really nice person. Um, and um, and he, he was working with a company called Harper's Guitars. And uh, they made the very first guitars for him. He, he came up with a design and then they produced the first run of guitars. And um, it, again, in a similar way to Kazataka, Steve uh, contacted me about some aspects of the guitar which he wasn't sure about. And he came up with his own design because his first ones, the body shape was a little bit different. It wasn't quite the same as Brian's, but yeah. essentially it was a red special. There was no, no big deal, but it, it had a slightly more, slightly fatter shape to it and a, a, a sort of a heavier neck at that time. And um, I think the first customer was Joe Millo, an old friend of mine from America. And he bought the first one. Um, and um, then uh, Steve contacted me about um, the possibility of getting one to Brian. And so I contacted Brian because I, I, I used to write occasionally to him, not, not very often, but I wrote him a letter and just said, look, I've, I've met this guy in America um, and he's very keen to send you a guitar. And um, so I said, if he sends it over, would you accept it? And he said, yeah, it'd be very interesting. Maybe we could set up some kind of business or something. I think he was looking at that himself at the time. And uh, so anyway, I said to Steve, yeah, fine, send one over. Well, anyway, they, Steve finished one off and sent it over. And when it came, that was around the time I first met Pete Malandrone and Pete contacted me and asked me if it was arrived or whatever. I said, no, I'm still waiting for it, but as soon as it comes, I'll let you know. And as an introduction, he sent over about 30 white slide switches for Brian because Brian yeah. wanted some slide switches. So he sent this big bag of slide switches over to warm him up a bit. And uh, so anyway, he, um, the guitar arrived. And when it arrived, it, I don't know what had happened to it, but there was a problem with the neck. It had been quite badly bashed about. And uh, it, it was really, it was unplayable. And I took it to my guitar tech, um, just to have a look at it. And he said, no, he said, I can't really do anything with it. And so I said, look to Steve, I'm really sorry, but it looks like it's been damaged in transit. Um, so he said, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll take it back and I'll make another one. So what he did, cut a long story short, he, he made another guitar, but he made it, it was purple. It was a purple colour. And it had, I think it had um, like a tortoise shell, um, yeah, well, anyway, it's a sort of fancy scratch plate and everything on it. Yeah. And basically, he just wanted to show him that it didn't have to be a red special. It could be anything. Like, a bit like some of yeah. the guilds were all different colours. But he wanted to show that, that he could do anything with it. That came over. And um, I left it, really, I think I left it with Steve then. To, it, it got his foot in the door. And uh, I think Brian went back to him and said, uh, or his management said, I, I, I don't really want to sort of, get involved with with you as a company to make guitars but i'm happy for you to make the guitars and they did draw yeah. up a little contract where he paid brian a token which was agreed between them and and that so it was all sorted that's why because i know there's a bit of criticism towards him here, here, around that time about him making guitars without brian's permission but he had got permission so yeah yeah i think we figured out was it last year or the year before there were some bits and pieces on the forum and i think we almost felt I'm probably going to misquote this now. So forgive me if you are the people I'm talking about and I've misquoted you. But I think we figured out that Brian may have thought he was somebody else. Yes. Didn't Steve meet him? And then it kind of put Steve off. Yeah, um, I think um, the, that Brian and his team must have had some kind of conflict with other people. And um, he... He had prearranged with Brian's, uh, Steve had prearranged with Brian's. It, I mean, this is on the internet, so everybody can read that because yeah. Steve put yeah. that report up about it. Yeah, which, that's um, right. The reason yeah. why he closed his company. But um, he went to meet Brian and he was taking a, a, a modified version of his guitar, more accurate version of it to give him as a gift. And uh, he went to Las Vegas, I think it was, to see him with his brother. And one of Brian's PAs had 
set it up. So it was all, you know, all sorted. And when when Steve walked in with the guitar, um, Brian seemed to be, I think it, it probably, I had, probably hadn't been informed correctly or whatever, that there was something missing in the communication. And uh, he tore a strip off Steve and they said, you know, you did ripping me and my dad off and, you know, and Steve took it really badly and quite rightly so, you know, it was yeah. a misinformation thing, but Steve, yeah. it, it really turned Steve off doing it and that was the end of it for him. It was a disappointing night. Although I think Brian realised afterwards that a mistake had been made. Um, it yeah. was a bit late for Steve. I think he realised that it, it wasn't going to happen, which is a shame because Steve's a lovely guy. Yeah, um, again, that Steve's website was one of the only, when I joined, it, was, it had sound files on. And yeah. I, I mean, I, this is, I was doing my apprenticeship at the time and I used to do, um, we had to do key, I was in the adult learners group because my employer wanted me to do my apprenticeship quicker. So they stick me with the adults to try and get me through it. And they had to do their key skills, so like English, math, science. But yeah, I'd done pretty well at at those so I didn't have to do it so I was literally sat in the room with these adults doing their English maths and science and given a laptop with access to the internet so I just used to play around in Google and I'd got into guitar and what guitar does Brian May play I was sort of owning a Burns at that point and then I, I happened across Steve's website I just used to sit in this classroom with headphones in for hours listening to these yeah. demos on yeah <laughs> <laughs> and so they were really good as well you know yeah no, they were yeah. it was real oh. testament to his guitar i used to just and then just sit there looking at the guitar daydreaming about owning one and making that sound well so i was quite well fortunate Steve. to uh to get the blue the blue red special that i've got blue red special the blue yeah. special um because it was one of uh, steve had made a prototype of um of the same guitar but it was like natural wood swamp ash and i, I just thought it looked brilliant and he made me a blue one and uh, yeah. i think you've seen that with the humbuckers on yeah and uh and that's a nice guitar, really nice. It's completely different. It had a steeper headstock yeah. angle and that type of thing. But uh, I, I've still got it. It's great. You know, nice guitar. No, very nice. Well, I've spent a few hours in your your music room with you yeah. over the years. So a long time ago now, probably. But It is, yeah. It's been a while. Played. Yeah, I'll have to come <laughs> up again one day. Yeah, definitely. Okay. More than welcome. Yeah. We'll have to book that in a diary for, well, later on when we're allowed to. <laughs> That's it. Um, <laughs> and then um, you also, because you seem to, uh, there's a, a modern a theme appearing here. When people start building Red Specials commercially, um, they tend to get in touch, Mark. And you ended up meeting Andrew Guyton and playing the red and green um, prototypes that we learned in his podcast. He named Vic and Bob which I don't think we'd known. I, I never knew recently. the names of them, funnily enough, so that was quite <laughs> interesting. But, um, yeah, because I, I'd heard about Andrew Guyton, and obviously because there was little snippets of information coming out here and there, and I thought, I'll give him a ring. You know, it'd be interesting, see if we can get a little bit of snippet of info out of him. But I, I rang him up, and he's, uh, and as you know, he's a, really, he's a real gentleman. Yeah. He's a really lovely guy. And um, Mark Barnett, you may remember him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Mark uh, was very interested in buying one of these and uh, he eventually bought number one. And uh, so they probably had to make Brian 001. <laughs> so, yeah. so I don't know about that. But um, he was very keen to buy number one. He wanted to buy number one. And um, uh, so he and I went to visit um, uh, Andrew at his workshop and um, he had... Uh, the, uh, the, the the prototypes um, sort of built up. I think they were I think they were veneered. Yes, they were veneered at the time, but they hadn't got any finish on them or anything like that. And uh, he very kindly rigged one up. He put pickups in it and everything. I had a play on it, and I was thinking, oh, this sounds fantastic, you know. And um, and it really did sound good and uh, and played absolutely brilliantly you know it was a real class piece of equipment you know yeah. and um so they were the green and the red uh, the green and the red but um but then the next time i went back i think my, um i went back again with mark because mark obviously was going to be buying one of these guitars i think colin bought number two actually colin bowell yeah yeah i can't remember and, uh, i know i misquoted it on the andy's podcast but 
Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, he yeah, he got which number one two and yeah. uh, Mark Barnett yeah. bought number one. And um, uh, we, we went back and because um, uh, he wanted to speak to um, Andy, Andy Guyton about it. And uh, he got them both there, all lacquered up, ready, sort of just about yeah. ready to go to Brian. So we got to sort of have a play with them. I've got a photo of them holding them both, you know, on my lap. <laughs> you know, but they, they were lovely guitars, really, really nice guitars, no doubt about it. Yeah. And, um, you know, and he, Andy was so enthusiastic about them. And, um, again, always a really nice, polite person. I had thousands yeah. of phone calls with him and probably pissed him off left, right and centre. But he was, uh, you know, such a nice guy, always the gentleman and still is, yeah. you know. There's a, a common theme with us Red Special folk of old, I think. Yeah, sort of. All, all relative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get all sort set of, sometimes, yeah. don't we? But, uh, well, sometimes we do, but it's, we're passionate about it, I think. And that's, I think so. Yeah, I think when you know the the forum and it's since I've been around in twenty years is is evolved and come and gone and changed. And as we mentioned with Steve Turpin, we've had different views on things. But yeah, I think what when you take that step back and remove yourself from like the 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 fight that's going on at that time or the disagreement, <laughs> you. You, what the, the common theme is we're all really passionate about this and we're all so passionate we have these very strong views but we're all brought together for the love of brian's guitar ultimately yeah. and well i think eventually it, it goes full circle i mean i you know, I've, I've had a few fallouts with people over the years as you know and but it, i haven't now I'm, I'm friends with them all again anyway so yeah, yeah. i never really fall out with people you, you just like god i don't want this and then you walk away for a bit and then you feel better the next yeah. day don't you and it, it's all blows yeah, over certainly. yeah well and and i think what's what's great is that you know we started um, i forget what year it was the first meetup in um sheffield that adam bent put on which i think was the, one of the first if the, the first meetup is you actually mm. obviously you, you'd got to meet some of the people like julian and martin um and mark and and whatnot throughout and Peter through KZ guitars and whatnot, but the meetups really started to bring everyone together. And that's where actually, when you talk to someone face to face or on the phone, or even through a Zoom call, you, you've seen someone smile and you can see yeah. that they're in, you know, you get the real feel for someone, don't you? Because the, yeah. the keyboard does take away some of that communication and the intonation in someone's voice and body language. And yeah. what what what's great when you start to meet people and, you know, is, it's the smile that that you get back when you're talking about something and the interest that they have. And you really do realize that you're all there for that common reason and goal. And, and it's, it's the love of the guitar and, and what it means to them and their own story. And um, I think that's, that's the real strength of the forum that's coming out now. And I think, yeah, it's just great to get people together, isn't it? And it is. And talk yeah. about the thing because, because it, it's such a, a lovely thing. Um, anyway, I'm rambling. <laughs> As per usual, um, we'll edit all that ramble out because that's rubbish. We mentioned about you meeting Nigel. Um, well, it, he moved on to making the Cat Deaky, didn't he? Uh, yeah, he, he did. He developed the Cat Deaky, and, uh, which I think he originally started with where Greg had sort of got to. And then yeah. it moved on to a different beast because they're in different countries. It probably made it very difficult yeah. for them to work together all the time. Did you meet Dave Peterson around that time? Because I've spent some, I mean, I did actually meet Dave and I spent a fair bit of time with him and he's another lovely chap. And you couldn't ask to meet a more lovely chap than Dave. Um, he's, he is sweet, isn't he? Uh, yeah, I, I, the only time I met him was um, at one of the Huggles Coat meetups and he yeah. came back here to my house uh, after, um, I think the following day or after after it had finished. And we were playing with sort of like deaky style amps that we'd put together, yeah. you know, our orchestrators and those type of things. Yeah. And um, uh, and he was telling us quite a bit about it sort of loosely as we all sort of sat around, you know, talking with him. Because he was quite shy, if you wasn't he, if you remember. And he was sort yeah. of stood there with the microphone and didn't move. But then he loosened up and became quite a celebrity, didn't he? You know, he's yeah. such a nice fellow. I, I went with... Um random story i went with mike ride to pick up um a dave peterson ac30 that mike had commissioned dave to make yeah after someone had uh, to um, dave peterson stuff wasn't he mike yeah 
and he um mike was going to collect his amp and wanted me to go i think not wanted me to go along with him i was around that way and so, i'm going to see dave peterson if you want to come you, want, you know get in the car we chat about red specials pick up my amp and chat and so all right yeah that sounds like a good idea but so we turned up at dave peterson's house i've got no idea what to expect i've brought, seen the vox book and seen martin's dave peterson ac30 on his old max 11 website and yeah heard the sound files and you sort of knocked on this terrace house which looks like any terrace house in the middle and wherever it was east anglia dave opens the door and very politely invites us in and you go into past the the front room which looked normal into this room opens out and it's just like a complete workshop in this dining room there's <laughs> just handmade tools over there and amp parts there and just yeah. like all the best all of the best um engineers same when you go to to like guyton's workshop there's just bits and pieces everywhere and um you're just like how how does dave create these wonderful amps in this you know where the hell he know where anything is but no lovely chap um and I think he was involved originally with Greg, wasn't he? In, in making he was, yeah, the, they uh, worked together. Yeah, that's right. And uh, in fact, um, there's quite a few photos floating around, that, aren't there? Of, um, Brian's original and the, or the one that John Deacon made and the two prototypes that they worked yeah. together on. And um, that, um, when they did the, um, uh, oh, what's it called? The... Uh, I forgot Ooh, what it's called now. No, uh, no, the the unplugged MTV. Sorry, the MTV yeah, sorry, unplugged. Yeah. But I'll, I'll say that again. So yeah, <laughs> and they um they went to the MTV unplugged thing where Brian played unplugged with his acoustic, but he later snuck his red, oh well Greg's red special yeah. in and his DK amp. Um, they took them there. I think I think there's some footage yeah. uh, or some photos of them sort of messing around with the amps, you know, setting up. But um, yeah, so Greg and um, Greg and Dave did quite a lot of groundwork, I think, on the original yeah. design. And Greg still got yeah. one of his uh, deekies. Yeah, that's pretty cool because that's mm. that thing itself is history. It is. And I think because yeah. Dave was building AC30 Brian Mays at that point, and he went on to make the AC30s for the We Were Rocky shows. And when I met him in the early 2000s, probably 2006, 2007, he was still going into London once a week to service them for the show. Yeah. Um, and then obviously Greg was making the AC30s for the We Will Rock You shows in Australia and then made Brian the AC30s for using live based off of those. And then, yeah, it's quite interesting how it all sort of, they obviously yeah. met and found a common interest and started making stuff together and, and then Nigel was involved as well, but mm. a lot, um, not so much at that point. And then Nigel's obviously come out from all of that and ended up where he is and making the yeah. things. And <laughs> it's quite yeah. interesting how it's all, it all well, sort it was of all over the planet, and, wasn't it? There was, yeah. you know, you've got sort of Greg one end of the world and yeah, you've got, um, you know, Nigel the other end. And it's, uh, I suppose it, uh, it yeah, there's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yourself, Mark, have your own deaky story as well, don't you? Because obviously you, you're probably one of the first people outside of Brian's inner circle and recording people that got to play through the deaky when you went to visit Brian's house. And I think that sparked some interest in you on your own 20 year or so journey of trying to replicate oh. the deaky amp. Yeah, um, yeah, I have. I, I, well, yeah, I did. I did actually manage to put a, a full original one together. It took a long time um, because um, I, I got to know early on some of the details of the um, of the DCAM. No, nobody knew what it had come out of, and um, the, the actual circuit. But the speaker cab, I thought I would probably have more chance of finding than the, the radio circuit because yeah. the radio circuit could have been in any radio. I mean, there are yeah. millions and millions of radios on the planet from all eras and no idea what year it came out or anything like that. So I originally, uh, I, I managed to find the tweeter and the woofer quite early on. In fact, I think I got the tweeter from yourself. Yeah, you might well have done actually. That was a long time yeah. back though. That was that was a long time. Early 2000s. <laughs> yeah, you had I think two. I got... Yeah, and I've lost one. 
and I don't know yeah. where that is. Um, yeah, but I'm pretty I, sure I bought one from yourself. Yeah, um, which was the the, the tweeter that I uh, I've still got, and um, and then I managed to pick up a woofer, the main speaker, the same model. Um, in fact, Lee Spater myself found them. He had one, and I've got. And um, the cab um, uh, for, for my when I started trying to build a DKM, um, Nigel was very kind um, and uh, let me have um, a, a prototype cab that he built. It was an MDF one, but uh, it was you know size wise everything. It was perfect, yeah. and he really kindly let me have it. It was no use to him at the time, so uh, I had that off him and sort of chucked the speakers into that and, and played around with the orchestrator circuit board and sort of messed with that. Then um, I was on, um, uh, what's that pro, uh, thing called Gumtree, and I was just looking for old speakers because I had no idea what make the Deaky speaker was or anything because it was just an old cab, common cab from the 60s or thereabouts with that sort of funny grill cloth. And, uh, and I... I it was only about four years back or something like that when I found the cab. And I, I saw this speaker. I just put old speakers, bookshelf speakers or something like that in the search. And I saw this speaker and I thought, that looks like a DKM cab. And, uh, and there were a few photos and um, I, it showed the back. And sure enough, it had those funny little shaped corners and yeah. the, the screws. And I thought, oh, Wow. I've got to get this. So I paid £20 for them, <laughs> including, <laughs> including the postage. And uh, these two speakers came and I opened them up and there were Deaky speakers in them. And I'm thinking, oh, I was like hopping up and down. But when I looked at the speakers, they were the, exactly the same cases. They looked identical to the originals, but they were a slightly different model. They were eight ohm versions of the right. same speakers. And um, so I took them out, put mine in. <laughs> and uh, so I got the cab, if you like. And, um, and because Lee Spate, my friend, was working on one himself, I, I let him have the other cab. And um, so we had a cab each. Uh, they need a bit of work. They're a little bit, you know, tatty. So we sort of cleaned them up a little bit. And, um, and then one day I was at work. And me and technology don't get on, as I've already said to you. And I got a ping come up on my phone. And I put a search in for Rhodesian radios because I knew that the supersonic radios were made in Rhodesia. And this thing came up on my phone. I just got into work. And we don't get very good signal in work. And it said, um, KB International Radio. And I thought, what? <laughs> and I was like God, trying to get my phone to get into eBay and, and I, anyway I got it got the radio for 20 pounds and um including postage the same as the speaker and and I was even unsure as to whether it had even gone through because the signal kept dropping out on my phone and anyway I contacted the guy who had bought it from and I realized that I'd actually paid for it in my wife's um pay, pay payment card so I thought it's got, it's got my name and then it's got my wife's name as the payer. And I thought he's going to think this is a scam, you know, and it's not going to arrive. So anyway, ultimately it did arrive. Everything was okay. And I cautiously opened the radio and there it was. There was the circuit. Yeah. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And uh, I thought, oh my God, I don't believe this. So anyway, I, I, the radio didn't work. And so I didn't know if the, if the circuit was no good. But basically, it was a tuning issue. So the tuner didn't work. I've got the radio, but I just took the circuit out, stuck it in the box, and it worked. And that was it. So I just it's tidied nice. it up, put the bit of twin and earth in it and all that sort of thing, and yeah. made it into what it is. Made it look like it yeah. is the brother or sister or cousin yeah. of the Deaky Amp. Yeah. I did actually send a, some photos and some information to Brian. And yeah. Brian replied. Uh, on an email and he was quite surprised and he said you know quite amazed at my perseverance in trying to find it <laughs> but um and he actually said you know i'd like to ab it one day it'd be interesting to see how they compare but we haven't yeah. got around to doing that but uh, maybe that'll no. happen one day i don't know so yes yeah, so i well, have but 
it was it was strange because at the time I was working with um, Manuel Angelini yeah. and Lee Spate because uh, Manuel, as we all know, has sort of made a few pedals, doxy pedals that are sort of related yeah. to the Dikis, had this obsession with the with the Dikis, yeah. like most of us have. And um, uh, he was looking at producing an accurate or as close as possible version of the Dikis amp. Uh, because obviously the cat one had finished um, because they Nigel put out the note to say that he was no longer making them because the yeah. I think they have trouble with the transistor and things like that getting hold of all the parts. Yeah, I think from speaking to Nigel, it's it's just the amount of parts they go through and getting the right parts in tolerance and making them ROHS compliant yeah. and doing what they need to and then getting in spec parts. I think it's, it just doesn't the sums don't add up to no. to make it a, a commercially continuous product so i think he and he was getting fed up a wire in them i think but don't quote me on that no well i mean that's understandable when you're making the same thing over and over and over again yeah you know it probably does become a bit of a chore you know yeah but man yeah manuel i mean he um or man manual um i remember the conversation when he asked because it was on the forum is you remember Greg Coxell making yes. boosters under the Electrolead name and some of the best boosters still that you can buy if one comes up, buy it because they're, they're awesome. Um, and Greg used to be called Coxie on the forum. That's it. He and did Coxie and Doxie. Yeah. <laughs> Greg, Greg was trying to make a Deaky replica, wasn't he? And he called it yeah. the Doxie. And then uh, literally Man Manuel asked, can, can I use the Doxie name and make this pedal? Because I really like it. And Greg's like, yeah, whatever. And that, yeah. so that's born the Doxie. Um, oh, oh that's good i didn't went, know that yeah yeah it's, it's and then because we all found out about <laughs> this the supersonic conquest radio through uh through um an old forum name of yuri who yes. uh, <laughs> we all know posted up, some, posted up some photos of the circuit on the antique radio forum i think wasn't it that's right yeah and then it all disappeared, then, yeah, <laughs> didn't it? You remember then, originally, it all disappeared. Yeah, and then the mods there were able to put it back, and um, someone they didn't like it. They didn't said, like the way it was removed, did they? No, and I think I mean it's a bit of a shame, really. Yuri is a character and uh, part of the history of the forum, but through Yuri yeah. doing what he did, we did end up finding out what what it was from. That's um, right. And then Manuel's. Well, Sorry, no, I'm butting in on you. Sorry. That's all right. No, no. Manuel's obviously gone off to um, find out all about them and not just found the radio and then replicated it, but he's gone full on into the history of the whole company and how it came to be and some fantastic information on his website um, about the whole story of that little radio coming to be and why it came to be and then some pictures from the factory. It's, it's a really interesting story. Well, I think that's the thing about Manuel. He, he, he's started with the history. He actually tracked down the people who built the amp. And that, yeah. that to me was just mind blowing. You know, the, he actually found the people who designed it, built it, yeah. troubleshooted it, you know, and yeah. put them together, even sold them. I don't know. But he'd gone that deep into it. And, and the thing with him is he, he worked from, the actual parts not you know not having to he was kind of spoiled in a way because he actually found the circuit quite early on and yeah. um himself and he actually does own an original deke circuit and um and he also um with the transformers he had a, a, a another circuit that used the exact same transformers and from that he was able to you know uh, reverse engineer things and sort of yeah. get his accurate and he's worked really hard and he spent a long time doing that it took it you know yeah. talking probably five or six years getting to that point and all along he's striving to improve the, yeah. the, the appearance and everything yeah, fantastic bits of kit for sure once when you, oh yeah um, get well, one. Uh, well that's it i mean the thing with the, the you know the the, the speaker the speaker side of it obviously the the uh, elacs and that were long gone and um he came up with um some speakers that he wanted to try to use 
and uh, he sent them over and Lee and I spent three years um, playing around with uh, crossovers and all sorts but we, we did it in quite a methodical way and I remember we, we spent weeks because Lee lives uh, sort of up north a bit and he travelled by me quite a lot so he used to drop in for a coffee every now and then and we'd sort of work on things and record a little bit and whatever and the way Manuel's the cab side came about with the speaker the speaker side came about was with with his it, we sent him lots of recordings that we'd made so he could hear the differences and we tried things in with the guitar in phase and out of phase on this just the same speaker to hear the differences and you when you start playing with these crossovers and stuff we did everything by ear which was uh, i mean i know nigel spent a lot of time doing everything very technical you know he's way up there way up there yeah. with all that and i don't stand a chance of getting involved in that side of it but we, we did it really by ear and we tried to fine tune as, as closely as possible to the original speakers um how how we could get the tone right and we learned yeah. quite a bit really from that but the, it took three years to sort of say yeah i think that's about as far as we can go with it and so everything was like in and out of phase settings, different pickup settings, see what different, if, if we tweak that, do we lose that screech and, or do we get less bass? And, and it was a real, it was an eye opener, but it got there in the end, but it was all about comparing it to the original parts and trying to get the original parts to work with that. So manual's amp as it stands now is, I don't know, it's, it's, it's excellent. I mean, well, you've, you've, you've played them, haven't you? Yeah, I certainly have. Yep, no, they're very good. It's um, I always find the the, the DQ is an interesting one though, because what you hear on the on, on the radio, what you hear on the album, and what you hear in the music. I'm showing my age now. Um, even what you hear compared to same as an AC30, and I think you described it really well at the beginning of the podcast when you talked about that compressed sound. When yeah. you're in a room with the speaker without it being mic'd up and you're experiencing the speakers and the amplifier circuit, whether that's the DQ or the Vox AC30, it's not the same as when you mic it up and then listen back to it. No. And I think that's the trick with the DQ amp is it really to get to get the sound that we probably know and think we love and, and whatnot. For me, I, I was never there I mean, it's a fantastic sounding thing in the room, don't get me wrong, but you really need to try and capture that into software or into recording it to then listen back to it to actually hear the same thing that you hear on a Queen album. Well, the mic placement is important with the DQ. Yeah. That, that's definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, And we did that demo at the meetup, the last yeah. meetup, the um, pre-COVID meetup. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when we could all hug and kiss, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and lift each other. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is one hell of a photograph. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, there's a great. I mean, Mark bought his. Um, we we're really lucky that year. Actually, it was a great, great meetup, and it was a lovely moment for me personally because arranged the meetups. I never expect people to turn up, and you know, anyone that does is everyone's welcome. And we were really lucky because we'd sort of put the shout out for DQ amps to come along and I think Dan Thomas had bought his cat DQ and Julian had bought his and yeah. one of the other ones he'd modded and then Mark rocks up having not told anyone he was coming or not telling me or anyone <laughs> that he's coming and it's like Mark's here wow I'm not seeing you for ages Mark and it's like yeah. massive chat and he's like I've got my DQ amps with me and we we literally had this like if you can imagine a school hall with tables set up like a dinner table all in a line and there's six DQ amps and Marks there, <laughs> and they all look the same. And, yeah, <laughs> we're going through each one, and you can really hear the difference. And yeah, we sort of went through a little bit because Martin was there as well. I think Martin was playing the guitar with his um his guidance and, and into um I forget what treble booster we used, Mark. Not that it probably matters, but you could really hear the, the difference. It was Martin's BC one four nine. Yeah, yeah. So we were going through the different leaky amps and. Matt Netherwood's very quiet. <laughs> the <DGM>. breath, <laughs> the breath one. <laughs> yeah, um, it did it sound, sound really good, good, even though. though it wasn't very loud. Yeah. Um, I mean, perfect practice. I mean, there's a market there, Matt. If you're listening, yeah. it's, uh, 
hard to play a DQ amp because they're really loud when they're when they're on. Obviously, they're when loud they're as all. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's um not till you you mic it up. Same with an AC30. As soon as you mic it up and you you find that sweet spot and you do a little bit of experimentation, you get that that compressed queen tone. That sort of yeah. That's what I, it's really hard to describe it, like how it sounds because um, it's really hard to describe sounds and I'm not well, the most it, articulate with that. It, the, I mean, when I demoed that that thing, I, I mean, Nigel might agree with, uh, disagree with me on this because obviously he does everything very technically and he uses oscilloscopes yeah. and stuff to prove, you know, what, what the frequencies are and that type of thing. But I only really go on what I hear and how I hear it. And um, the... When I blocked the woofer and the tweeter off, you know, and, and yeah. did that, when I took the tweeter out, the one thing I noticed for me was that I think that the tweeter, regardless of how much it kicks out, you know, the tweeter is quite quiet, I think. It's that small bit of treble that's there off that speaker that makes the deaky tone. That's what I feel. Yeah. If you block that off, it, just sounds like any other sort of attempt at trying to make a DQ, if you like. But with that, just yeah. that breath, and even even on the cats, they're the same. They've got a very small amount of treble. If you if you put the book over the big woofer and listen yeah. to the cat, you can just hear that little sting in the tone yeah. that's there, and that's what gives it that. I think that's what gives it yeah. that tone. Well, I, feel, I mean, we did that demo at the meetup, didn't we? And you put the book we over did. it, and yeah, the room. I think everyone agreed in the room that was willing to to voice an opinion. But yeah, no, it's, it's really <laughs> yeah. good. It's yeah. great to um, there's a lovely moment that as well because I mean, I mean, um, listening to you as well. You, I mean, you've been to Brian's house and then you've played the original DC amp and then you've had this massive long journey of getting your own and then you're in a room with all of us numpties with like six of them lined up. <laughs> I was beginning to forget where I was with them, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> And it was like when we were demoing the pedal boards with Martin. I'm going, yeah, that's that two, was... no, one, but no, two, two boots, <laughs> not one boots. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's good fun, Mark. It's all good. And that's the thing, though, isn't it? It's that, that, you know, who would have thought when when any of us started that we'd end up in this position and, yeah, you know, 20 year friendships. And, you know, I might not talk to you for, I think um, I had a brief hiatus from Red Specials for yeah, a few I mean, years. And then. For a, Two or three years, really, didn't you? Yeah. Um, don't talk about that. But um, just <laughs> times in life, really, yeah. and other yeah. focuses and, and knuckling down, really, and trying to sort myself out and then coming back when I was in a different position. But welcome back just like I'd never left and chatting to you just like I was 10 years ago, 15 yeah. years ago. And it's the strength of the community, I think. It's it's a lovely place to be. We're very fortunate, I think, for well, I mean, I find them. the people really friendly. I like talking to them all, and I've, um, I don't, I'm, I'm not so much in the stuff these days on the forum, but I do tend to help people if they get problems. Yeah, and I, I either mail them privately on the message, or I just put something on there. Like today, I put a diagram up to show them, you know, yeah. things that they, they were a bit, they weren't sure what things were. You know, I just find that interesting. I like doing that. Well, it's just nice to help people as well. And we were all yeah. in that, you know, that position once as well, where mm. either the information wasn't readily available or it wasn't there or we were finding it out. And now we're fortunate enough to know a lot more about it. And mm. you know, you've got you've got 30, 40 years worth of experience in this now. So uh... <laughs> yeah, uh, for my pains. But uh, <laughs> I, I have a friend in Germany who I speak to quite a lot. He's not a member of the forum or anything. Um He's uh, he's actually a blind guitarist. He was originally uh, he was able to see at one time, but uh, over the years his eyes deteriorated and he's he's virtually blind. And um, his name's Stefan uh, Stefan Brooks. He's in uh, Germany, and um, I communicate with him quite a lot. And uh, over he's very passionate about the Red Special, and he's someone I've helped over the years. We've we've spoke about his equipment and. And um, he's bought various bits of equipment to improve it. And he's so happy with his tone now over the years that we've, we've sort of spoke about. So well, maybe better to get that. It's a bit cheaper, but it does a better job or, you know, and we go through all this stuff together. And um, in fact, he was only communicating with me the other day and he bought a BC149 from uh, Lee. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I must have influenced him into getting it. But um, yeah. he, he he received it today. So he's going to let me know when he's had a bit of a play with it. But yeah. he battles on. He, he, he works hard, you know. And he's a good player considering he, he can't see well enough to see what he's doing on the fingerboard. He flies up and down that fingerboard better than I do. You know? Yeah, he, it's, it's interesting because I, I started this podcast and I thought, oh, I'm going to do this to capture some conversations with my friends as if we were having a beer in the after the meetup. Um, and he's emailed me as a fan of the podcast saying, thank you for putting these stories together. Can you... I do really? Oh, um, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah he's, so nice to, um, he's very nice. I had to remind myself of my German GCSE and I wrote back in some German to him just to... <laughs> oh, that's nice, yeah. Because uh, he'll, yeah. he'll be pleased because the podcasts are helpful to him with it being just an audible yeah. you know, thing. So. I, I hadn't considered it at all. I was just thinking it'd be nice to chat to my friends a bit, really, and use mm. the podcast to record it and then put it out. But it's um, lovely that people are actually taking time to email back and say, I got this from that or this from that. Mm. I never thought this would go any further, really, than just me chatting right. to you lot. Um. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good. I, no. I, you know, I'm pleased you do it. It's, you know, and all credit to you because it's not an easy thing to do. And uh, you've got young children, of course, which take up your time. So it's trying to battle with all that lot and sort of get in, find a little gap, you know, where you can sort of get it together. They, they actually listen to it as well because oh, um, Vicky, they? my wife, yeah, she puts it on in the car. Um, when we're travelling long distances, I think, to try and make them go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to put mine on then? That'll put them to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we've got a long journey soon, so we're <laughs> recording for two hours. So, yeah. no, it's, it's all good. But, no, it's, there, there are some fantastic people in this community that, that you've helped craft and create, and you've provided lots of experience and knowledge and information to most of us over the time, Mark. So I just want to say thank you to you for being there at the right time probably being a little bit fortunate but also making your own luck and um helping us all out when you could have chosen not to because it without your input into um brianmayworld.com i think a lot of people wouldn't have ended up possibly we'd have ended up in a place but we possibly wouldn't have ended up where we are now and um yeah thank you for sharing all of your experiences with us and being so friendly and um sharing your journey with us and and being there when we all get stuck with various bits and pieces because yeah without you we, we might not be where we are oh that's that's very kind of you uh, my pleasure though you know <laughs> i like um i like helping people and you know so as this is a sort of a platform you know people out there need any help they can get a hold of me on the thing by all means just send me a message don't be afraid to send a message you know i'll always reply yeah. to it so yeah. um yeah, Mark's very helpful, everyone. If you need anything, he's um, <laughs> it's something he doesn't know. It's probably not worth knowing, and um, he's probably fixed. Why? Well, I know he gets bombarded <laughs> with pick up pick up height questions, and uh, oh yeah, that's fun. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and various bits and pieces over the years. Yeah, that's good. I know, one. Mark. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you tonight. Um, thank you so much for your time, as always. I know I. Uh, probably spoken to you on the back in the day we used to have hour-long conversations about random yeah. rubbish to do with red specials that, <laughs> all throughout different times of the day and um yeah without you i never would have got as far as i've gotten with all of this and um yeah thank you very much mate it's always a pleasure to chat likewise thank you very much for inviting me it's been really good i've really enjoyed it and considering my memory's going i don't think i did too bad <laughs> But then I'm interested well, in this. It. The stuff I'm not interested in is what I'm losing. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. That's the stuff you don't need anyway. You yeah. Remember it's the like stuff Homer, you need. isn't it? You put something in and something yeah. falls out the and other comes side. Out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you, you keep safe, Mark. And um, yeah, keep well. And I'll see you again soon, hopefully. And likewise. Yeah, please do. Please look after yourself. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. It's really nice. I loved it. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I just want to say a massive thank you to Mark, not only for agreeing to be on the podcast, but for also spending such a long time with me on the phone, chatting about Red Specials and his history and all of the information that he's passed on. Mark is an absolute wealth of knowledge on the forums and passes out information and handy tips for anyone that is in trouble or needs some advice, and he's a true asset to the forum. Thanks again, Mark, for being on the episode. And now, moving on, there'll be more podcast episodes coming soon. We're also still editing the Red Special Guitar Meetup 2021 videos and 
we have some exciting announcements to come. We're going to be launching a, another Zoom Christmas drinks, which the date will be coming out really soon for that. We've also got the date nearly booked in for the Red Special Guitar Meetup in 2022 in the UK. And I will also be going to the Red Special Guitar Meetup in the United States in Phoenix, Arizona in March in early 2022. So I'll be making sure to take my camera and my podcasting kit over there because we've got some fantastic people lined up to speak to over there. Also, just want to say a massive thank you to my patrons for sticking by me with the lack of podcasts coming out. You guys have been absolutely fantastic. Couldn't do this without you. You've been absolutely amazing and your support and push to make me do this stuff is great and much appreciated. Um, I love our little group. If it's something you're interested in, please head over to redspecialguitarpodcast.com, click on support us and that'll take you to the Patreon site and you can support the channel for as little as a less than a coffee per month and all of that helps me to put these together. I also want to say a massive thank you just in general to everyone on the forum. You guys rock. I couldn't, really wouldn't do it without you all. And um, yeah, stay safe and I'll catch you in the next one.